Good evening. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education work session on Wednesday, September 16th, when we start with opening with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. Do I have a motion to open the work session? So moved. Second. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to open our work session. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you all and good evening. Thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. All right, good evening. So we'll jump jump right in to 2.01, our Schoology demonstration. So I'm gonna ask Mr. Page and Mrs. Forbes to come forward. Uh, at our last board meeting, we talked about offering a demonstration so that the board members and the public could see uh, what the platform looks like. And we're gonna present from two different perspectives. We're gonna give you a, a view of what students see, and then we're gonna give you a view of what parents see. So uh, with that, Thank you for being here, Mr. Page and Ms. Forbes. Good evening. Good evening. Again, I am Julie Forbes, the Supervisor of Accountability Assessment and Data Management. Good evening, Michael Page, Supervisor of Environmental Literacy, Health, Physical Education, and Science. And today, our purpose is to communicate and provide updates on the QACPS implementation of Schoology and demonstrate the student and parent Schoology view. So we wanted to begin just by uh, reviewing why we chose Schoology. Why, why are we um, even discussing Schoology at this point in the year? And so really, the implementation of Schoology came out of some of the instructional challenges that we encountered in the spring, in the spring of 2020. And so some of those challenges that arose um, with the transition to a completely new learning environment in that virtual learning environment, first was that we experienced just inconsistent methods of delivering instruction. So lots of different ways that instruction was being delivered. Um, you know, sometimes email, Google Classroom, different external systems. And of course, you know, teachers were working incredibly hard in such you know, a unique situation doing such wonderful work, but it still was, um, it, really coming from different directions. And so for parents, the, the feedback we received was that it would be nice to begin to streamline some of that instruction. Um, another big factor was that it was difficult to track student engagement and attendance. And that actually corresponds directly to the feedback that we received on the QACPS um, recovery plan. And so the feedback we received was that we needed a system to clearly track student engagement and attendance. And that's something that Schoology has built in. There's a student analytics feature. That is not something that we had before. So we're, we're grateful we have that system in place now so that we can meet that requirement from the Maryland State Department of Education. Um, another you know, challenge we encountered in the spring was just that lack of access to technology um, for some of our families, some of our staff, uh, we also encountered just it was more difficult to provide supports to specialized groups of students, English learners, students with IEPs, individualized educational plans who receive special education services. Um, and also just the varying capacity of our teachers to deliver online instruction. We're all in different places, especially with you know our backgrounds in technology. And so that really varied amongst all of our staff. Uh, we used Google Classroom quite a bit, um, and, and we found some limitations last spring, and that's really why we began the, the journey of exploring a learning management system. Um, a few of the pieces that we encountered were that there's no principal or parent view in Google Classroom. So right now in Schoology, a principal is able to basically have access into their building. Um, they can see their students, they can see their teachers, they can really have access to all of these things. In Google Classroom, they needed to be manually added to classes. They would then have to go into that individual course and it wasn't set up basically in the building sense. So that's been really positive. Also having that unique parent view in Schoology was not something that parents had in Google Classroom and they had to actually go in through their student accounts. Um, and again, we didn't have those analytics that are now required. Um, and even just some things such as creating assessments, we found that you know there wasn't, there's not an assessment tool built into Google Classroom. So teachers were actually, some teachers, they were using a variety of resources and some were using even the Google survey as a way to kind of put quick assessments together. And one of the things that you'll see in just a few minutes is that there's a very robust assessment tool built into um, Schoology. So we'll show you that. Um, 
And then, you know, once we started talking about Schoology um, and, and presenting the demonstrations to different stakeholder groups, the, the feedback we received was just overwhelmingly positive. And that was some of the information we shared. I believe it was at the June 17th meeting was how we, the positive res response we received from stakeholders. So we just wanted to review some of uh, the celebrations and challenges that we've been uh, seeing and, and witnessing throughout the, this uh, opening implementation. Some of the celebrations that we have uh, are that our staff, uh, principals, teachers, supervisors, they are doing an outstanding job of being creative and putting forth a tremendous effort in, in this situation. Um, really want to make sure we give them kudos that they are, they are working very hard to make sure that instruction is being delivered at a high quality. Uh, so we just wanted to make sure that everybody knows, you know, they are doing a great job. Uh, parents and students' determination and uh, adaptability. So our parents and students, you know, we, we talk to them daily. I know our schools are doing the same. You know, they, they are faced with this online learning and they're working through it and, and they, are, they, they have some great determination to make sure that their students uh, and, you know, th that they're doing well. Um, Overall functionality of the system, so impl implementation-wise, we're going through the same hiccups that you would go through with any any system that you implement, and um, you know we we are dealing with those as they come in, and it's kind of been a stages. You know, we worked on getting uh, getting everybody in. That includes students, parents, um, and uh, the, you know the teachers and the principals. So it's a very big implementation there that we were able to get them in. Then we were working on making assignments and getting things set up. And then this past couple of weeks have been uh, looking at assessments and getting those assessments up and running and the functionality of them. So it's been pretty good uh, in terms of getting that up and running. Professional development rollout, you know, we had, to, we had a, a, a great team of, of teacher leaders who have been supporting the schools. Um, they have just been doing an outstanding job. We meet with them every Wednesday now. Uh, we send them updates every Friday professional development from Schoology on the opening week, and we just continue to push out new information as we learn it. So uh, professional development rollout has been excellent. Um, uh, and I really wanna reach out to those uh, teacher leaders who are just doing a great job in supporting the schools. So thank you to them. Uh, the response time, you know, we talked about this at our last presentation. We try to get our responses out as quickly as possible. So we are sitting in there, you know, in our offices researching uh, specific issues, going through them, working with uh, several of our schools or our teachers or our parents or whoever it may be that's having the issue. We really do try to get uh, the response to them as quick as possible, uh, sometimes also at night. Uh, as, as we had discussed last, last conversation. Organized rollout, we had a clear plan, we have weekly updates, we have a lot of things that are set in place that, that uh, you know, the schools are looking for, um, and we try to make sure that they have all the information that they need. Some of the biggest challenges right now that we've been facing is the conductivity, so internet conductivity, um, and uh, I do wanna just, you know, it goes kind of into the next one, the platform issues and lag time. The, you know, we're seeing nationwide shutdowns of Google Drive. We're seeing very large issues at a uh, national level that are that are affecting our uh, local schools. Um, so we also have many counties who have adapted Schoology, and Schoology is having overload issues too. So the systems right now are being overloaded with not only our students but also our parents doing their work. Uh, on these on these platforms, so um, I just want to make sure that everybody realizes that some of the issues that we are facing are national issues, and they're not just Queen Anne's County issues. They are they are very big issues that are happening at a national level. Um, just recently, you know, we we have brought up dashboards, so we look at Google Dashboard every every day to make sure that they're not having issues, or when we do have an issue that we look at, we're looking Schoology's dashboard, they just they just brought that up, uh, and we've been able to look at that. We're also looking at some of our internet providers to make sure that they're having, if they're having conductivity issues, that we also know there, so that we can start uh, informing teachers during instruction, saying, hey, there's an outage, or hey, there's something going on in this, at a bigger level than your classroom because we're seeing that sometimes uh, the issues are happening right then and there within the classroom. 
And we also want to just recognize that this is a learning curve, not only for Schoology, but distance, you know, virtual learning in itself. So we're, we're trying our best to work parents and caregivers through, through the process. Our students, our teachers are doing a great job of working with their students and making sure that they have all the things that they need. So there, those are our, our big celebrations that we have and, and some of the challenges that we're facing. Um, the next thing is we always want to make sure that you are aware of some of the timelines and some of the items that we're doing. So Schoology weekly updates. So these are email updates that contain information and resources to Schoology. They go out to pretty much all instructional staff. Uh, I'm sorry. They go to our lead teachers, they go to our principals and our supervisors, and then they're disseminated out as necessary. Um, these, these updates we've shared with you before, um, and, and they are very helpful for the sites. And actually, we gather a lot of the issues and from the lead teachers, and then we push out the solutions on, on, that, on that Friday, generally. Uh, Schoology training, we just we went through a training yesterday. Um, uh, that training was about gradebook integration and assessments and rubrics. We also have another training with our lead teachers uh, tomorrow. So we have been pulling in a lot of feedback and we're trying to push back with some, with some professional de development and professional learning. Um, so those are some of the issues that we're facing right now and we're looking at other options in order to continue the professional development of our teachers and, and our teacher leaders. Um, that also goes on to uh, Schoology training too. So teacher leaders will be presented with information learned in Schoology trainings. And just one quick update. Um, based on some of the feedback we received at the last board meeting and after having discussions with our Schoology teacher leaders, we wanted to provide additional support to parents and caregivers and families. So on our website, um, if you go to the parent page, you will see that there Parents and students, caregivers can contact their school, of course, for assistance, but they also have a Board of Education contact now as well. So we did make that addition, So and we appreciate that feedback. And um, so that's been going really well. So again, we encourage families to reach out to us. We are here to support you too. And that quick response time is you know, the same for our staff as it is for our families. And I would say most folks, if it's during um, the day, get a response probably within a couple of hours, if not sooner, certainly within a 24 hour turnaround, but oftentimes it's much more uh, quick than that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Before you start the demonstration, I, I have a couple sure. questions. Um, mm -hmm. One thing is um, we got to, I'm still getting feedback that it, the transition is very difficult. And what's difficult is the students are still, these are high school students still trying to, you know, navigate the the whole virtual thing and then they pop this new plan on them they have been discussing letting know the teachers are f fabulous they're trying very hard to get this right some of the teachers it's extremely frustrating for them and they've even voiced they'd love to have an opportunity to pop back to google for certain things they're trying to do but they can't they're not allowed to so um, I, I wanted to just there was an email that came out from um, a high school students from Kent Island High School 43 high school and students from Kent Island and Queen Anne's signed this and they've got issues on here with Schoology. I'm not, not sure if you got, there's been no reply to her. Um, she sent it to the board and um, Dr. Kane. So I'm wondering if maybe you guys could get a hold of this and maybe sure. respond with and, and alleviate some of their concerns. There's 43 kids on here that sure. are Oh, it would be our about. pleasure too, yeah. Okay, Absolutely. I'll forward, if it's all right with Dr. Kane, I'll forward Absolutely. it to them. Because uh, they haven't been responding, and they put it out September 11th. So I'll forward it to you all, and please respond to them, and let them know, because there's a whole bunch of kids on here yeah, that are worried yeah, about course. this. Thank you. Yeah. When something like that goes to a board member, I, I would urge that as soon as it lands, it be uh, forwarded to the folks that can put into action a response. We all, I wouldn't we wait for a meeting to bring it up, unless you just got it. We go ahead with okay. integration. That'd be great. great. Um, so what we're going to watch, it's about four minutes. And so bear with me. It was my <coughs> first uh, oh. attempt at making a video. Oh, just with respect to questions on the first part. Could we wait till at the end? It won't be pertinent at the okay. end. Yeah, that was reasonable. Uh, these are quick, you know, one sentence things. Uh, uh, what was the, the issue that had the longest time for response 
you, know, you said there was one that there was a variance of of, uh, of time for response. I mean, sometimes, like I said, we typically are able to get a response to someone sometimes within, within the day. Oh yeah, it's always within the day. It just depends yeah. on how long it takes us to research it. So I would say probably in the first week of implementation, you know, Mr. Page and I are also learning right along with our colleagues. Um, so there were some that we had to research. Sometimes we contact Schoology. Um, so, you know, it may have taken an hour oh. to, you know, research, but now I think we've got quite a good kind of toolbox, I guess you could say, of, of when things come up and sometimes like the user encountered issues that come up, so we're able to quickly give a response, but usually not not too long. And if there is a case that it's something that we can't fix and we need to reach out to Schoology, we let them know, we put in a help ticket, we kind of keep them updated as, as we move along. The contact for high school, middle school, elementary, mm -hmm. is general across the board or is it mm -hmm. for each? Okay, yep. that's good. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, interesting question that came to me, and then I'm going to shut up and let the 40 minutes come because I'm getting the eyeball, the, the, the stinky <laughs> eye from the chairman. Uh, <clears throat> what would a premature, uh, pre-end of semester return due to uh, the proper grading transferring from one system and then all of a sudden getting back into the classroom? Would that be disruptive? So in regards to Schoology, we're still going to be using this platform regardless of where so we are. If things materially changed, uh, we could as quickly go back to class uh, if the health department agreed, and there wouldn't be a lost step in learning. And maybe Ingrate. that's not the question that you should be answering. Yeah, I don't think that it is. I mean, we're st we'll still use Schoology whether we are face-to-face -face or virtual. I think that's what you're looking that's for. That's right. Thank you. You were worried about the transition of the grades. Yeah. So the they'll, grade. they'll automatically be rolling along. Is that what I understand? Dr. And that was the advantage of Schoology. Correct. Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So the only question I had, and I would ask this, sure. on our website, the BOE contact, can we please put it in Spanish as well? Absolutely. Okay. Oh, that's one thing I would ask for. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So for the next portion, um, like I said, <laughs> we're about to watch a four minute video and um, much as our staff have had a learning curve with creating videos, um, I went ahead and created this and our hope is to kind of build up a library of similar videos. So this demonstrates what the student view looks like. And um, I was actually speaking with um, one of our staff who works with our English learners and our families um, of English learners and we were talking about building both an English library and a Spanish so library. this is going resources. to be an actual lesson that, mm -hmm. are we going to be graded? Maybe. Uh, we'll okay, see. We'll see if there's then. a test at the end. <laughs> <laughs> take, take some notes. Okay. Today I'm going to show you how a student logs into their QACPS Schoology account. First, the student will navigate to qacps.schoology.com. This will prompt the student to enter their student Google account information and password similar to other QACPS programs. Students will be taken to their Schoology dashboard. This is where they will see their courses listed. Elementary students will see five course tiles, their main class, which includes the grade level and section, and other UA courses. Secondary students will see their individual subject area courses, similar to how they are displayed in their student schedule, English, math, science, physical education, etc. The student will begin by choosing the appropriate course by clicking on it. The first place the student should go is the correct week. I'm going to the week of September 14 through 18 by clicking on the folder. Then choose the correct day. This will take the student into their assignments and activities for the day. I'm going to respond to the class discussion first. I'm going to read the prompt and then write my own response in the discussion box. Post when you're done. You will notice that in the student account, the student view shows all of the discussion responses of other students in the class. I'm going to navigate back to my weekly folder to see what my next assignment is. The next assignment that I'm going to complete is titled Letter to Teacher. 
Assignments can use a variety of resources, and this assignment connects to a Google document. The first step is to click where it says My Document. Each student will receive their own version of the assignment to edit. If you see an error message displayed, make sure you are logged into your QACPS Google student account. You can double check this by clicking here. You may need to reconnect your Google account. Click the edit button, complete the assignment, and then choose submit. This will send the completed assignment to your teacher. And again, I'm gonna navigate up to the top bar where it shows the breadcrumbs and go back to my weekly folder to go back and complete my last activity for the day. The final activity for me today is a reading test. When students take assessments in Schoology, the first button they'll see is start attempt. This will cause the test to load. There are many different question types that a teacher can choose to use in a Schoology assignment. These are just a few examples. Choose the correct response for this multiple choice question and then choose next. The next question is a matching question. I'm going to drag the correct answer to the appropriate column to the right. And click next when I'm done. Question directs the student to circle the picture of the heart. I will use my trackpad or mouse to make a circle. And again, click next when done. This last question asks me to label an image. And then hit review, because that's the last question. When I'm done, I will hit finish. Today's video shared a few features that you may see on a student Schoology account. Thanks for watching. This was for what grade? It's, it was just a demo, so I just oh, made it up okay. with silly fake questions. And so it's a fake student account to protect confidentiality. Um, so obviously not real content or questions, but just mostly to demonstrate the features. <clears throat> Is spelling and grammar supposed to be <laughs> I guess with subsequent tests, because they're actually overriding uh, software that'll actually correct everything or tell you to correct mm -hmm. it and enhance the, the student's grade when they should read, really know how to do it themselves. Yeah, and there's a lot of great feedback tools that teachers can use in those kind of instances, whether the student's completing but a Google they document. They shouldn't use a feedback tool if they don't understand how to spell. They, they should, it should be found out and helped. Oh, right? Absolutely. I got a hundred. <clears throat> so, so now we're going to review kind of what the parent sees in terms of Schoology and. So what we have visible here is we have the page that this, the parent would go to, and then on the right-hand side of that page, we have kind of a key. This is also one of the resources that the parents can access in order to uh, get support in terms of how to, uh, I would say, navigate through the platform and see some of the items that their student is, is participating in. So number one is the student activity. Uh, this area in the center of the page displays the child's recent submissions and grades. So what we would see here is all the activity that the student is participating in. Number two uh, is the is the enrollment. So we, what you can do is you can toggle between uh, different courses that your child is currently enrolled in along along with several other items. Number three is the recent grades. So, and this area is listed as uh, the grades, assignments, tests, quizzes, and discussions to view the grades and items. Check the item in, that you'd like to view. So there you can also see that. 
Uh, below that, number four, number four is the overdue. So this is where the, the, the parent would see items that are overdue for that student. And if they wanted to reach out to their, their child, they could say, hey, got to notice that this particular item is overdue. Um, and they could, they could say, make sure you submit that. The next one is number five. Number five is upcoming items. So the parent can see any upcoming items that the student might have to complete that at that time. Um, so we can also encourage our students or children to say, hey, you got something coming up. Make sure you take a look at it. Um, next one, number six, is the courses. So there you can see uh, exactly what courses the child is in. So you can uh, view the different courses there. Next one is groups. Now the groups is more of uh, something that the student would be assigned to. Um, so you can see what groups your child is in uh, with that function. And then the grading function, which is uh, number eight, there you would see um, the grade reports and any masteries that the child had, has, has done. So overall, uh, also on the upper right hand side, um, you can also switch between the children there. So there's a little drop down menu that you, if you have multiple children, even if they're in different schools, you can still toggle between those those students and go into their different platforms so you could see multiple multiple stu students sir there's a number nine on here that's also not listed. yes so the number nine the number nine is actually thank you for bringing that to my attention uh number nine is not on there and we just that was just something we forgot to put over there but number nine is the calendar and the calendar is also a way for the, the parent to see when certain things are due so you could look at the month if the teacher has had has instruction that goes out throughout that month you could see when items are actually due so you could have that on your calendar and you can look at the calendar for that particular course and see what was due so does the parent when the parent is when the teacher assigns an assignment, does it automatically populate that calendar or do they have to do that separately? Yes, so as long as it's given a date, it automatically pushes into that, mm -hmm. that calendar. Right. That's my understanding. So a parent number, I apologize for asking a question. No, you're fine. A parent number could have several students under it. Mm -hmm depending on how many students are so if you have three if you have three children when you go into that child's so if I select my son it would it would then turn all of that into his information if I were to go into my other sons it would change all that information over to them so it it will it will actually change all the updates all the overdue it will change everything to to meet that child thank you So again, that goes to this that that same question, uh, or sorry, what I brought up in the last slide is that you can toggle between the students. So if you see student two, student two, um, that is that is where you can switch between the two students, and then you can also select that drop down menu to filter between uh, different categories, which are updates, submissions, and comments. So the parent can actually see what their student, his or her student has commented on, or just know that there was a comment sent? So that would be more of the discussion. So the parent would see what they would ha the student had done in the discussion. I think the, the comment there is more about what, if the child got a comment on their assessment. So the parent wouldn't be able to see the discussion of other students? Only no, their own Only students. theirs, yes. Again, this is, this is another uh, slide of what the parent sees. We just put this in here so that you also see that the parent can see very similar to what the child can see. So as you can see, they, they have the, um, the week of, they, then they have the daily folders, and then they also have the, the assignment view there. So it's very similar. We also, we tr we, I think that's a great feature here is that you are actually seeing what is, what is in that, uh, that student's course so you can see all the things that are happening within there and this procedure all of this is done in real time and parents can look at it they were and whenever we return the children to school which I hope is sooner rather than later this continues that's correct so this is an ongoing process. 
uh, and that's how we teach. Yes, uh, except that the teachers are in person teaching, but these are are also filled out all these questions so that if we go back uh, because of uh, a surge or something of the sort, this just picks up right where the classroom left off. Do I, do I, am I got, got that clear? So, so if, I may, if I'm hearing you correctly, if, if we go back into school and then we were to be rem have to leave school, we, this, this program is something that can be utilized while we're in school, while we're out of school. I mean, and I it can be, I thought, it can be very easily yeah, flipped. I, I thought we said that that's what we would do. It, it, it's, it's in process all the time when we're teaching. Right. So parents can look at what's going on. It's like a, a real time report card about where kids are uh, in grades, uh, submitting the work, et cetera. So that's a good thing. <clears throat> question um is there a, there's no method for them to to write write something down on a piece of paper and get it in their answer in they got to be able to type i mean the, the, the struggle is them having to type all these answers in all the essays they're all going to do it all by computer then the, so so there is the the ability to do audio there is the ability to do video submissions of assignments um and if a child is having difficulty, I would ask them to reach out to their teachers, and if the you know they if they need to submit it via writing, then they need to communicate that to the teacher. I mean, if there's an issue, we need to be able to support the child with that specific issue. I'm trying to follow this on my computer here. Page seven, the video site that you did. I couldn't get it up on this. That will be up so parents can, when they review this meeting, can go back and see that. I didn't. I couldn't get it on this. I saw it up here, but I didn't. I can't get it. Is yeah. There... Um, so if a parent goes into currently, if they go into the document on the board docs agenda and they click on the box and they hit play, it will. The video is embedded in the PDF. It is. So it should come up. <laughs> yes. Okay. Then on page eight, if it, on mine, it was pretty blurry. Uh, I'm not saying I can see too well. But a schoology mm -hmm. demonstration, it just, if it just can be a little clearer, I have a right now tough time seeing this. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is, and I know internet action is a, is a problem with some, you know, capabilities. People that do not have internet, we're going to do some kind of recording lessons and stuff like that. Is that, am I asking that question? Yes, so we've asked teachers to uh, record lessons so that their ch children can access them at a later time. Um, there are some students who a, are working on paper packets, but as you can see, it's a bit of a disadvantage to do that when we have instruction embedded in this learning management system. How do teachers, I'm sure they're overwhelmed by teaching all day and doing this virtual learning. If they do packets and pre-recorded things, who will, who will check that? I mean, they're, what, what, they wouldn't have time to do that. That's why we want to reduce those paper packets. Uh -huh. I know reduce them, but I mean, mm -hmm. if they have five students in their class doing that, will they have, I mean, do they have enough time on their agenda to do that plus do distant learning too? Yep, so we gave teachers an additional um, hour pretty much at the secondary level because they had smaller chunks of time to plan, so we gave them an additional hour. Teachers in elementary school already had an hour every day to do training um, or to do planning. And there's some office hours time as well, so there's additional time for everybody so to do planning. Pre somebody's working pre-recorded or um, uh, paper packets, they will have ability to get to their teacher and do stuff. Correct. And okay. teachers are being supported with paper packets. So teacher specialists, uh, reading math specialists, administrators are assisting with the paper package production. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's take an example. We go back to school in January and the end of January, uh, some remarkable thing happens and uh, the schools have to close. Uh, you know, with Friday we're open, Monday we're closed. This thing is ongoing and we just can switch from one to the other. Mm -hmm. And then somebody says, oh, schools are open again in five days. We haven't lost any speed. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. Okay. Knows Anyone else? Have a question? Some more questions? Um, 
So right now, from from things I see, kids are submitting work online, but they still have to take photographs of actual work, especially in the math department, to prove they they did the work. So is there any change coming in that field where they have to take a picture with the phone, upload it, in addition to entering the answer on Schoology <coughs> or whatever platform Schoology is sending them to? So is there any update to that? I'm to sorry, avoid that whole step. So we're doing algebra. You can only enter x equals 4. But now you got to take a picture of the actual work, the problems that you did to prove you did all the steps, and upload that so that that's accompanying what you just submitted. Right. So is there any change in the way that's going to happen <clears throat> as we learn more about this platform. Sure, and I'm sure that there will be uh, more opportunity. As we learn more, the more we know how teachers can input information into the system. But I just glanced at Ms. Smith, who is our supervisor for math, and, and asked her, and I'll ask her if she wants to add to that comment or to that conversation. Thank you for the record, Amy Smith. Uh, supervisor for mathematics. Thank you. Um, so within the platform, there are capacities when the teachers are creating items to actually unlock math types. So students, it's, it's very much connected like they are used to seeing when they take their standardized tests in the spring or if they were taking them for SATs and those kinds of things. It has a math type feature, so students some students might do pen and paper, pencil, paper kind of things and write out. And if the teacher is um, okay with them uploading it, which there shouldn't be a problem with that, they have that ability to be able to upload in that feature. But kids can actually type right in and show their work and their thinking using those math type features. So it, it's there in the system. And I know at the high school and middle school level, most of my teachers have been using that already. Now in elementary, they don't use as much math type. It's more typing of numbers and symbols and that's in the general platform. There's not a special feature that they have to turn on, but at the, um, when they're doing some of those algebra types, the teacher just has to turn it on for the assignment that they're putting out for students. Okay. So it is there. What's well, not happening. Okay. So I'll, I'll make another communication out to teachers and we'll, we'll model how they can turn that feature on. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Smith. And I have another question. I was talking with some teachers in Anne Arundel and Dorchester, and Dorchester has been using this Schoology for longer than we have apparently. So are all teachers aware that students have to log in through Schoology to hit the other platforms? So for their Google Meets, they have to go through Schoology, they can't go to their email and go through because they'll be missing the content. Because what I'm finding is some kids are logging on through Schoology, but some kids are going through their email, Google invite, the codes are different. So they're not joining the class, they're waiting for a teacher. By the time they figure it out and get back and figure out the code, they've been marked absent. So are all teachers aware that they need to inform the students You've got to come through Schoology to get to the meets, to go to the other activities, to do everything. We can, we can make that clear. Okay. Because I'm hearing a lot they of kids are waiting out here and it turns out they got the wrong code because they went through this and they didn't go through Schoology. I believe most of our, our instruction indicated that they needed to have that in Schoology and go to Schoology, get that information, and then go out to those meets. Okay. That's, that's the procedures that we've asked of okay. them. I have found if you send a reminder through email, you got to watch that code. If that code changes, you're not going to the original meeting. So maybe that's where the problem's coming. They're sending a, a reminder and it's giving it a different login code. Yeah, thank you. Um, my last question was why Schoology? What other platforms did we look at? And why did we pick this one? Like, did we look at Blackboard? Did we look at um, Pearson, who has like three different platforms? Why this one? Yeah, I can I can start too, and, and Mr. Page, feel free to jump in. So, um, we began this exploration in about May 
Uh, one of the unique features about Schoology that it really stood out for us was that it's integrated with PowerSchool. And so because of that integration that exists, it's the only um, system that we had access to that had that real-time integration. It's a nice place because then you're keeping your, st your student data in one place and you're not going outside to a, a different system. So we started with Schoology. We also knew that we were very limited on time. Um, as it was with launching Schoology, um, we had a very small time frame to bring professional development to our staff communicate all of those things. I mean, ideally you're doing this process over a year. We had a couple of months. Um, so we began with Schoology, we scheduled demonstrations. And at that point we solicited feedback from all of the stakeholder groups that participated in those demonstrations. Um, staff, uh, parents, administrators, supervisors, and um, the feedback was just overwhelmingly positive. So, you know, we did ask that question. We did pose that question to them we'll give you all the information. Here are the timelines we have to work with. At this point, do we as the, you know, a stakeholder group feel like we need to explore other systems given the timeline for professional development and rolling it out to our campuses or is this the system we wanna go with? And it was overwhelmingly positive that the folks that we worked with and there are about, I think 65 people that completed the survey um, who wanted to proceed with Schoology. And again, that integration was very unique that no other system had with the grade book and with that connection to PowerSchool. So we were able to have that um, unique um, integration that other systems couldn't do. Okay, so with that integration, the things that we already had, are they talking to each other, mm -hmm. going back and forth? Yes. Or is it just one-way communication? It's, it's back and forth, yeah. And, and we have abilities within the system because we have this integration that, you know, um, at the beginning of the year when we ran into any kind of system integration, you run into just small, unique errors because of the nature of the integration, we were able to fix them and in real time sync the system again so that we were able to get students back into the system immediately, which we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. So, so is there still anything out there that we have that's not talking to this, that teachers are still having a problem and having to still log into other issues? You can talk to that, about maybe curriculum? Yes, so, so there are some external tools that we utilize um, and we are in the process of integrating their interportability between our content resources with Schoology so that they can work within Schoology. So for example, what's not communicating with it right now that we're still waiting on or working on? So, so an example could be, you know, our primary resources for science, uh, you know, our, at the elementary level, our HMH product, the same thing with our reading, math. We're, we just haven't gotten to that point. So we're, we're to the point where we're getting people in, getting people comfortable, and then we're gonna start releasing some of those things. Another one is YouTube. We can start opening, you know, YouTube has an app. Um, some of those other instructional tools that we have in our classroom, we can start opening those apps to allow the teachers to use them more fluidly within Schoology itself. Okay. So it's just, it's just a matter of how much do we want to put on everybody all at once in terms of, and how much time do we actually have in order to, to make that happen. So it's, it's, it's a long process for each one mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, we have to make sure that they're communicating right, rostering right. One of the biggest issues is whether or not they actually can identify the child within Schoology. Mm -hmm. So it has to go from our, our rostering programs to that program then into Schoology and clearly identify all three of those as that individual student. So there's a lot of back-ended communication between all three systems that has to take place. And sometimes that's, that takes a lot of time. Okay, okay, thank you. There was a- Didn't uh, Schoology buy PowerPoint? There wasn't there an acquisition and integration that already existed? Uh, yes. Power School. Power School, yeah. That, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's what I thought. And that was one of the reasons Julia had mentioned. That's why we, that was one of the biggest reasons why we went with Schoology is because we already have a lot of those systems and it, and it are, you know, clearly talked. So one of the, one of the things that we have heard is that teachers were having to go back to Google Classroom in order to connect with everybody, everyone. So are, is there still problems with that or have they worked that out? That's, I haven't heard. I haven't yeah. heard that? Mm -mm. Okay. Do you know connect with individuals or connect with? With the, with the students they, in, in order to have everyone to see it all at the same time? Oh, um, that should be working okay in Schoology. Okay. Um, but, you know, feel free, and, and too, if you have any questions received from the community, feel free to direct them to us too. Okay. So we can help to address some of those as well. Um, 
so we can you know provide that support so i did have a parent contact me today that all of her um, son's grades are all f's at the moment <coughs> even though he's sent in all of you know everything that's been i mean I, again it's only been two weeks mm -hmm. so I, will that update you think or or is it just a fluke or i mean he's put everything in or have i just have them call you well, first, I think they need to check with the teacher. Okay. Oh, I did tell sure, that. Yeah, that the teacher that. Has, has put grades in, right, okay. that reflect the work that he's done. So that's the first I did stop. say that. Yeah. I just didn't know if you'd heard that across the board. Okay. Yeah. So it's probably just yeah. one time. There's a lot of complaint. Like we, you know, when we're troubleshooting accounts, we see, you know, we check accounts, and there's many, many, I, the, all the grade books I've seen are in progress and completed. And okay. so maybe it's just a, a unique situation. But if we can provide any support, please let us know. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm not sure it's unique. And, and um, <coughs> One of the things on the ease, to get the ease is um, there is, seems to be a lag. And so I, I might be popping in looking at my child's grades and I see these ease there. And he goes nuts. He goes, well, it's a delay on it. I talked to my teacher about it, you know. So he's, he's inquiring about it. But there seems to be a delay. So I think parents need to know that and before that, we go crazy on that. And, and that's and, something that we, so again, we're all becoming, you know, IT <laughs> you know, we're, we're expert. You know, I, I never thought so, so, you know, I'd be doing I some see you back stuff. there shaking your head. <laughs> but, but, uh, patience. It, um, <laughs> so, that was one of the things we discovered on the Schoology dashboard is that just imagine this influx of data coming to a system and being able to handle that much data, right? And so that's what Schoology is feeling right now is that some of those particular assessments and some of those updates are lagging. And they clearly state that in their dashboard is that they have had issues because I would say a good portion of the country is utilizing Schoology right now, just as the majority of the country is using Google. So we're seeing delays, major delays in Google. We're seeing major delays in Schoology. And that's something that was one of my points that I tried to emphasize is that there are things beyond us that are happening at a national level that are affecting our, our current process. And so when you see Google Drive shutting down for a full day, you know, or a majority of a day, and people are trying to do things within that, you're going to see major lag time. And we see that in our own jobs. We see that here. We see that at the schools and sites. So I'm not going to deny that there's not an issue there. That, I mean, it is. You might keep peace in the families if maybe you have like a, I don't know, like a, a little description of things that mm -hmm. you know, as things happen out to the parents to say beware and, of this beware of that and actually that's where we are as a team right now is uh, you know we just communicated that information out because it, that is that is something that's coming to our attention is that there are these places that we can go and we can see that there are national outages we can see that there are there are big issues happening beyond our beyond our school system we could always put something up on the website just kind of a general statement the parent page yeah. sure that, you know it's good that you're doing it right here as well yes because during peak hours particularly <laughs> during classroom yes. hours is when we're noticing that lag time because you're absolutely correct sometimes it's not updating on the parent side in real time it might take a couple of hours right. yes and that, so. and some of our parents are receiving mm -hmm. information that a child's if you know assignment might not have been submitted because that background lag is hasn't reached that particular notification yet and, so. and you know god bless the teachers because they are they are they have a knowledge of that and they're mm -hmm. they're encouraging the kids because i you know they freak out when this is happening some kids do and parents definitely freak out so, um another thing I, on the the part that the the math um supervisor came in with that there's um another program they can pop into to work do you have the same thing with science because you know we had the issue with science last year yes, some of the codes and chemistry and that's right and, so we do have we do have formula writing software in right, there. Okay. Yes, that's correct. We talked about that last that's year. That's right, and that's another advantage. And uh, you know, something also is that uh, Mrs. Smith mentioned is that some of the item types, some of the 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 tools that our students are utilizing within Schoology, are highly reflective of what our students are seeing within their state testing platforms. Uh -huh. So it's a huge advantage for us as a, as a school system to have this type of resource to say, we're going to give you these technology enhanced items and you're going to work through them with us in a comfortable environment. And then when we put you into that state testing platform, you'll know because a lot of that, that, that is a learning curve. That technology of the student understanding how to take a test online 
it's it's real. And I think that having this platform will greatly increase our students' success in terms of being persistent through those items because they know how to utilize them. Considering that half of uh, you know all the universities and colleges are all going to this, yeah, the they're going to have works. a leg up by the time they get there. Mm -hmm. That's they absolutely. Had issues with the the um, AP test last year, mm -hmm. yes. like popping into this thing, and it was it was awful. And so I think the college boards are now aware of it. And so if this is a standard way to do codes and stuff, it's that's great that our kids are learning. And Ms. Harper, you bring up a great point in terms of our transition to college and career readiness. This is just another step for our students to learn before they get into that, that environment. Absolutely. So I have a question, and I, I don't know that everybody knows. How are the teachers doing day to day? Are they able to reach out to their students? Is there a problem with connectivity? Are we, I mean, I'm sure there is across the board somewhere, but I just want to know what the general, I mean, here we are in week two, so. Our teachers generally care about our students, and they, they want generally, them to. Generally, I think all of them all, oh, yeah, they, I'm just they, talking about the connectivity. Yeah, they, I mean, and they work with them. I'll tell you personally, they, they reach out all the time to make sure that the, those kids are being successful. I just worry that every single school is on at the same time. That is correct. Every single school, every single person in all of the businesses that are on. I mean, yesterday I had to just bag this computer and just work from my phone. Every keystroke seemed like it took about 30 seconds. I mean, you can't type an email. You type an email an hour. It is insane when you get hundreds a day. So, I mean, connectivity is definitely an issue. So when parents send messages and say, you know, it's the lag time and, and the connectivity, it's real. I feel your pain. I experience the exact same thing. You know, unfortunately, we don't have control over that. Um, but it is absolutely, it's a concern. So I was leading up to this only because we've been talking to the county commissioner about trying to get the fires to come down to at least North County. And, uh, you know, this would hopefully, you know, put a little, put a little speed onto it because we definitely need it. So any other questions? I just have one recommendation. I, I mentioned it early um, in the summer too. When you're, you're talking about talking to stakeholders and you named a bunch of stakeholders, we do not have students, and the ones who use it need to be involved in the stakeholder. Mm -hmm. yeah. any, of the, any of the meetings you have, you've got to get their input, and they're very smart, and mm -hmm. if they haven't been included in this, they didn't include it in the summer, um, I, I don't think that's fair, mm -hmm. and I think you could learn a lot from having the ones who are living with it. We agree, and we'll absolutely make sure next time there's any kind of exploration of a system to involve our students. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, any other questions? Thank you all very, very, very much. It's very useful. Thank you, Mr. Page, Ms. Forbes. Yeah. So as they pack up and wipe the table off a little bit, thank you. I'm going to ask Mr. Kentop, and he has a whole crew of support behind him. We're going to give you a demonstration of Exact Path. And recall that Exact Path is the online platform that we're using to assess our students, determine where some of those academic, those learning gaps are. And um, it's been available to our children for quite some time. And they're going to give you some information um, about how we will implement that um, exact path program. So thank you, Mr. Kenta. Good evening. Good evening. I am Kevin Kintop. I am the program director of Arise Academy. I also work with summer school and online learning. As Dr. Kane mentioned, I have Ms. Bridget Passon, Ms. Amy Smith, and Ms. Michelle McNeil, all curriculum supervisors here with me this evening. Uh, they've been working and uh, helping with the Exact Path platform. They helped put the presentation together. And we just collectively decided I'll just kind of run the presentation, but they will be here to be able to answer any specific questions that you may need um, that would be directed in their areas. So the purpose of this presentation is to do several things this evening. First, make sure that we review the purpose of why we're using ExactPath. 
second will be to provide you with an overview of the platform so you see what the platform is. But then I'm gonna to try to give you an exact path experience from a kid's side so you see what they're seeing when they get in to use the program. I will finish by sharing off uh, the expectations for implementation for our, for our staff and for students for the year and then we'll answer any questions that you guys have about the program. So let's start off with the purpose of why we're using this. The Queen Anne's County Public Schools Recovery and Reopening Plan, in order to address requirement four, where it says early in the school years that we must determine where our students are instructionally so that we can identify the gaps and prepare a path for instructional success and recovery. In that plan, we identified exact path as the program that we were gonna use for that. So that is where that initially came from. Ms. Susan Grace Dubois was uh, presenting to you in the spring about that when, when this came up. So, the program exact path is actually part of the parent company Edmentum. Edmentum is the parent company. We actually use three of their platforms for different things. Um, and not part of my program, but based on questions that were just asked, Schoology integrates with a ton of things. We haven't utilized all of them, we, but Schoology doesn't integrate with everything that's out there because it's just, that's an impossibility. Exact path is one of the things that it does not integrate with. So I, I answer that question before we even get started. There's an easy access to it for kids and I will show that, but it's not integrated into their Schoology. Um, the three platforms that we do use with Edmentum currently are uh, Ed Options, which we use for our summer recovery program for high school students. We have the Play-Doh courseware that we use for online instruction. We've used it in the past for initial credit, for credit recovery, and we're actually using it right now for something called flex assignments in high school as a resource. And then the third part we use is Exact Path, and that's, that's what I'm gonna share with you tonight, um, the Exact Path program. So Exact Path meets four goals. Uh, it has four primary uh, targets. First target is it diagnoses on an individual basis where kids' strengths are and where their gaps are. That is through an assessment. Once it completes that assessment, it targets exactly what students need to learn, to reinforce, or to enrich. The third thing it then does is it sets a learning path for them and it gives them direct instruction through the program. They actually learn through the program, practice in the program, do some assessments in the program, it actually teaches them. And then the fourth piece of Exact Path is it allows our staff to monitor kids in real time on a daily basis where they are, how they're performing, if they're struggling with something, what they need to do, how to intervene. So this program does all four of these things. So I mentioned the diagnostic assessment. That is the first thing that students do. They take a test in both math and reading. In this test, we get reliable data on where kids' strengths are and where their gaps are. So we know what they are good at and how we can build upon those successes and we know where they're struggling and where we can provide some assistance. This assessment also gives us a scale score at the end. That scale score is important because we have the ability throughout the year then to measure growth of children. So we can see where they started, we can assess them kind of in the middle to see where they are to make adjustments, and at the end we can see what kind of growth they've made. So this diagnostic assessment was available to students in the summer as part of the Exact Path platform. And what happens is students start the test, it starts them at a question that's usually one grade below what they are registered in in our power school system. As the students answer questions, if they get it wrong, it kind of backs down the skill level a little bit. When it gets it right, when a student gets a question right, it moves it up. And if you notice on this graphic right here, essentially what it's doing is it's trying to find the sweet spot for a kid where they know certain skills. And it's almost an artificial intelligence type program. It is taking these answers and it's calculating through its metrics to determine exactly where a student should be learning and on the, what pathway. I will say, students sometimes are frustrated when they take the diagnostic test because they're used to taking a test and doing the best that they can and getting everything right. That's not what a diagnostic is designed for. A diagnostic is sometimes designed to make it harder so that we can see where they can be pushed and accelerated and when it gets too hard, it backs down to, to give them a comfort level. What you see on this screen is a perfect example of what a student might see on a test. They may get half of them right and half of them wrong, but that's how the program identifies exactly where the student is on the different skill levels. So we encourage students to do their best, 
to not get overly frustrated. And if they really don't know something, they take an educated guess on the answer and move on to the next question because the program will place them in the proper area based on their answers. The other thing we encourage is for parents not to help their children. It's natural natural tendency when a kid is taking this at home for when they're struggling for the parent to say, well, look, here, let me just show you. If you do this, and that's great, but if the child gets that question right on the diagnostic, the assessment then really starts to place their learning path at that level because it thinks that's where they are in a subject. So we encourage parents to try not to help them toward the diagnostic and just encourage them to do their best. Now, when they finish the test, the program immediately creates a learning path for them. In a learning path, a student is gonna be receiving four skill sets that they're gonna work on. The example I have up here right now is a math skill set. The same is, is true for reading. I'm just gonna show you a math one just to show you how it lays out. In a math skill set, they'll have four skills. It includes a lesson that they work through. In math, it, ex it includes practice, that they go through practice problems and applications. And then it provides them with a five question quiz on each skill. If they get an 80%, on that, with four or five out of five correct on that, they move on. If they get below that, it asks them to go through the lesson again, it resets the quiz and has them take it again. In this set of four skills, the student works through all four of them once they've passed all four of the quizzes. At the end, they unlock what's called a progress check. And the easiest description I can give you is, in each skill they take a quiz and at the end there's a test. That's the easiest way I can describe it. In that progress check, there's 20 questions now, and it's a mixture of all the skills that they just went over. It's five questions involved in each of them. It could be question one, five, 17, 18, and 19 is one skill or whatever. So the kids take this progress check, and they get results immediately after taking it. And it's neat the way that they have it in the program, because if they get 80% on three out of their four skills, they'll earn what are known as trophies in their, in their program. So a student is given four skills, three of the four, they did all the, the, pro, the, um, the lessons, they did the quizzes, they took their progress check, they did well, they get these trophies and they're getting ready to move on. However, you notice it's only three. In this particular case, there's one that did not. So when a student has one that they struggled with and they scored less than 80% on, on that progress check, the program automatically rolls their next four skills out and includes what's called a building block of that skill. So if I'm struggling with proportions and I don't pass the, the test or the progress check on proportions, it may move me back to a lesson on fractions because that's a building block to learning how to use proportions. It automatically moves me to the prerequisite skill I'm gonna need to be successful in that area. Now, if the program does not have a building block there, it will give them an alternate lesson with different examples and a different way of teaching it to try to help the student understand and be successful in that skill. So the student starts off with four skills, they go to their progress check, they pass, they, they got their trophy for three out of four, now they get a new set of four skills. The one is a, is a building block of the one that they struggled with last time, so it helps keep them going. Now, some people worry that if they don't pass that building block, what happens? They'll receive, one, they'll go back even further, one additional building block to try to build the foundational skill needed for the student. If a student struggles on two building blocks, the program automatically will, will go to a different skill and it'll flag to the teacher that the child has had trouble here and may need some additional assistance. So it doesn't make them, the whole year continue to work on that particular thing if they're struggling with it. Um, okay, so the students are doing these progress checks. They, they, they retake if they need to, they move on to new, new sets if they, if they need to. If they've passed that building block with a five or a four now, it'll move them back to their original skill and give them a chance to show that they've met that knowledge. And this is both in, in the reading and both in the math. Now I know this is a lot of information and this was a two hour training that we did with teachers so I don't expect you to understand all the metrics of it but the one thing I want you to really understand is individualized. If a student is successful, it moves them on. If they struggle with something, it gives them foundational stuff to work on to help build up that skill. And it doesn't stop. Once they've mastered four skills, it gives them four new skills. A kid can't say, I'm done. I did my exact path. It continues to build them. And it can build them above grade level, multiple grades above grade level. So if they're being successful, it'll keep moving them up. It's a, con it's a consistent skill path that they'll continue to work on. 
So what you see on the screen right now is actually what students see in the computer. And this is when you were asking about the Schoology integration before. When students log into Google, they get a home page. It just says Google. If you notice on the screen in the upper left, there's a folder called student.qacps.org bookmarks. All the students have this on their computer. And it's a list of sites, common sites, that the students are using regularly. So it's been bookmarked by the system for them. The very first one is called Clever Application Portal. When um, the presentation before me was talking about there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the background with computer, we've all become IT people. This is one of them. Clever is a program that runs in the background that speaks information from our power school system into these programs. It brings over the kids, it brings over the teachers so they can set up classes and do things. This Clever application portal actually every night updates. A new student gets enrolled today, it moves them into our programs. So the students go to this Clever application portal and there's a list of multiple programs that they can access from here. They don't need a username, they don't need a password. They, because they've signed in with Google, it's a single sign-on. Any of these things they can, they can get to. And in a giant E right in the middle is the E for Admentum. And all they do is click on it, and it'll pull them right to their home screen. There's no logins, no passwords to remember, nothing of that nature. So even though it's not integrated with Schoology, it is two clicks, and they're in. So they go into Google, mm -hmm. and they're also going to go into Schoology. They're I mean, students are going to go into Google every day regardless because they're going to check their email and uh, their, their things are going to be in Google. Absolutely. So th that's how they log onto their computers. I mean, it, it, they log in via and it goes right to their Google. So I'm going to show you um, just some brief slides of what the kids actually see. So the first one I'm going to show you is what happens with a kindergartner to a second grader. When they click in, this is what it looks like. It looks like a children's game. It's very animated. It's an undersea theme. There's not a lot on there to click, so it's not too, they don't have to know how to do too much. And it's pretty clear, like on this particular one on Learning Path, it says start math. I mean, it's fairly obvious of what to do. If they click into that Learning Path, it looks like this. And it's very clear to them again. It shows their lesson, their practice, and their quiz that they need to take. The blue check mark tells them that they finished it. The orange says they're still working on it. They can go back and finish. And the green tells that they haven't started yet. It's, it's very intuitive. Is it perfect? Absolutely not. But it's very intuitive to like what a children's game would be so that those kids can navigate it. That's just the result after they've taken the test. After the, this is their actual learning path where they go in and start their lessons. Okay. Yes. So you have to press some button to see a path and a question. At that previous screen, it just says start your path and you go. <laughs> so kindergarten to second grade, very animated, very kid friendly. When you move to grades three through five, there's still animation, but there's more information now on the screen. There's more for them to see. They have assignments that they know that they need to be working on, a few more buttons that they can push, um, but still, I think, very elementary friendly to students. And when you look off the homepage into their learning path, it lays out all four of their skills that they're working on for them. It tells them what the skills are. It has the green boxes showing what they need to start. It's very clear, and as you see on the right-hand side, it shows them their progress check is locked. They can't unlock it until everything on that screen has been went through. So very user-friendly for, for a child. And, and the next screen, I actually showed one where a kid is, has been through parts of it. You see parts are checked, part is orange that they're still going, and part is green. Now, the one thing I will tell you and that, that is somewhat nice um, and, and, and can be, it's, it's a kind of a double-edged sword. Sometimes students can go right to the quiz because it might be a skill that it was a fluke when they did their thing, they're, they're a little low, they should be higher on that skill, and they go to their quiz and they can ace that quiz quickly. This program's not gonna hold them back because they didn't finish the whole lesson part of it. So it's not gonna make them sit and go through all, if they could do that. But if a kid tries to guess and gets it wrong, it locks it and they have to go through the lesson in order, in order to do it. Who does target students? Uh, do all students in elementary school take this and then uh, it's all assessed and then they each progress at their own rate? Yes. Okay. And it, actually, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later, but it's K through 12. Do you have a language arts on here too? The, there is a language arts portion to this that includes a lot of reading and speaking skills, and it was a determination through the curriculum supervisors that we were gonna focus on the reading and the math um, categories. 
The last path would be our sixth through 12th graders path. And you'll see there's a jump from the animation to more of a structured computer program model. Um, it looks a little less fun and gamey, but there's still a lot of information on there that is very user friendly. Um, Active assignments, it lists the most recent thing at the top. So they know the next day, when someone said they're going to get to something, it's usually right there on the top. These, the example I've shown you has two diagnostics that children just click begin and they go. So this is what their home screen looks like. It's, it's not as animated, but it's got all the information there. And then if they go into their learning path, their learning path looks a little different also. But what you'll see is there are actually four skills there. The first skill is open. It has three, th three big boxes. And then the other three skills are beneath it with a little plus sign that kids can open them. Um, but it's the same thing. They have four skills they have to complete before they can unlock their, pr their progress check. And it gives them a color-coded reference at the top to let them know what they've completed and were successful at, what still needs to be done. So there's still a lot of user help on these screens. It just gets away from the more gamey looking type of. Don't you think sometimes that might help? Uh, that's, the pro that's the program. That's the program. I, I'm just explaining how the program. <laughs> to, I do think so, but I also don't think this is not requiring them to be uh, overly um, like they, ha computer literate because there's a lot of this stuff here that is still just like, okay, that's what I need to push. That color means this. I mean, there's a lot of clues right here on the home screen for them. It just looks like Charlie Brown's teacher. <laughs> Hard to understand. How's that? Looks like it's hard to understand. It, it, it's if I were if the screen I had didn't have those three boxes up, you just would see four skill sets that are there, four okay. plus signs. What happened was the first one was open for you, so you could see the lesson, the practice, and oh, the thing okay. that they had to do. Thank you. For okay. Me. Thank you. And that's why I said I apologize. I'm trying to do a 20 minute presentation from a two hour training, so I'm and, trying uh, to hit the highlights for you. Thank you. Good. Now, this is another new thing that came in for teachers uh, this year. So what was very important is to make sure that we have a good foundation of support for them um, in this program and for families. Um, the first uh, piece of support actually started early in the summer, and that was from Ms. Dubois. And I have to give her all the credit in the world. She did a ton of work on Exact Path before she left the position that she was in. She has on our website an Exact Path page that is still up with lots of explanations, videos um, for kids, for parents. Even I believe there's even in Spanish on there. Um, it, it's it's wonderful. So that is available all the time currently. We also, and you may not have even noticed it, and I didn't point it out on purpose, but on almost every page in the student's plan is this purple help center box, and it's on every teacher's page too. So if there's a topic, a question you have, it's just like in any other program, you click on it, you can type it, and there are a ton of resources that you can access through their website. Jennifer Caldwell is our implementation specialist. She is outstanding. I will tell you that it is almost as if she was an employee of the system. She is so concerned about making sure that we get this off the ground right. Um, I text and call her on cell phone regularly. She has given everyone that was trained her email address and she takes questions directly from them if they want it. Um, she has even created um, a Padlet page, which is a technology page, and she gave everybody the code to it. And she has all exact path resources there that she's done over the years when she's done her training for them to access. She is 100% available to us whenever we need her. Um, and the final, I, I have to include myself in this because I'm really in the point of contact within the system. If any teacher, school, parent has a question, it usually funnels through me. I try to get them an answer or I will go to Jen and get an answer. Um, I have become a novice in Exact Path probably a month ago to not a novice, <laughs> not an expert, but not a novice uh, in exact path at this point. Uh, I'm, I'm able to give uh, answers uh, pretty quickly. And what I have learned is, and, and I would imagine Mr. Page and Ms. Forbes would say the same thing, a lot of times there's other, there are other people in the system that can answer. It could be a technology issue for Mr. Combs to help resolve things. There are a ton of people that are willing to help out and give. So there are a lot of supports out there right now for teachers and parents if they need it. Um, and I've heard the questions a couple times on Schoology. I do make sure that they get some sort of response within 24 hours on any question. Try to have it the same day for them, but if it's something I don't know and I have to explore, it may take me a little longer time. I did mention to you Jen Caldwell has done some professional development. Just so that you're aware, 
The week the teachers returned, we had four two-hour sessions with elementary staff. We uh, were able to train approximately 120 staff, and we had two two-hour sessions for middle school, and we, we trained uh, approximately 60 staff. Last week on Wednesday, we did a two-hour session with high school reading and math teachers, uh, 40, approximately 40 staff in the program. And then next Wednesday on the 30th, we have a session plan with our, our school specialist and high school English and math department chairs because students will have been finished with the diagnostic and we'll have this data. And now we're gonna show them how they can start using that data, preparing to use that data, filter it and so forth. So right now we've had a total of eight professional development sessions that have been set up. And I was actually talking with one of the supervisors earlier. There are some people that can't make our session next week. And I'm sure if I call Ms. Caldwell, she'll just say, Kevin, just tell them when they want to meet and I'll go over the presentation. We record every training and we send it back to the school that was part of the training. So every training is recorded and they can go back and watch the, the professional development session recording if they need to. Implementation. For this year, and this goes to the question that you had asked before, Mr. Anderson, the reading diagnostic is being administered to every student grades K through 12. The math diagnostic is every student grade one through algebra one. So that's first grade to most likely ninth, maybe some 10th graders. And then once they are finished their diagnostic, uh, it is an expectation that the learning paths that the students are working on, that they will work on them for 30 minutes per week per subject. Re recommended on the asynchronous day. That's the word, the words of the year. Synchronous, asynchronous, and, and robust. Those are the three big words this year. Asynchronous on the day when we're not doing that live instruction, that time we're not doing, they'll be working in this. So that, that is the expectation that went out from the supervisors. Who's, uh, who's keeping track of all that? I mean, you guys, uh, Algebra 1, that's, um, that, that, that could be in high school, mm -hmm. and they've got multiple classes, and so. There actually, there is a quick little, what's called a challenge within the program teacher can set up for their kids. They call it a challenge. They have to complete 30 minutes and they can easily go in and pull a report how many kids met the challenge and had done their 30 minutes. I mean, who keeps track of that, that child? That child may not have math that. It, uh, in ninth that's grade, right. it's an everyday class. Yeah. So they are, every child is taking algebra right now. That's why it's, the, it's going up through algebra one right now. Oh, okay. That's not a semesterized so course as a freshman. Yes. The algebra one teacher. Though. Yes. Okay. And we have had conversations that some students will have to take the diagnostic for English, say, in the second half of the year, because that's when they're in English and that's when we can build off of it. Okay. Okay. So the last thing I want to share with you is really what I think is um, kind of the culminating piece to all of this. And there are a lot of benefits that ExactPath is providing for us at this point. Um, I've already explained to you the diagnostic tool, how it gives us a very good valid diagnostic in reading and math. We used STAR 360 before, so this is allowing us to replace that with this, along with many other things that it does. The second thing is that that individualized learning path that I was talking about, every person in this room could take the diagnostic and none of us would wind up with the same learning path. And even if we wound up with the same skill levels in certain areas, the learning and the questions and the quizzes are all from banks of materials. So it wouldn't even be the same things that we were doing. So it's, it's very individualized and differentiated for every student. Third, this now is a data point that we can use in school. It, we can look at our students, we can track them, we can see their growth. Um, I think that's an important piece for schools. And if I could have put this one in super bold and underline uh, the benefit that this is providing teachers with a resource that assists them in this blended virtual, virtual learning model that they're doing right now. Uh, during the asynchronous time frame. this is not something they have to create. They don't have to video it, they don't have to download it, they don't have to, they just have to assign their kids, say go work in this, and the program does the work for them. All they gotta do is monitor it. And we heard that in the training. When the teachers were training, the feedback we got was, this is pretty intuitive for us, and it's not asking us to do it. Like, I set up everything in the background. When they open it, their classes were already loaded. They, all the kids that were in their red roster from power school were in their at, uh, exact path classes. All they had to do is just monitor what's going on with the students. Um, other benefits. We usually use the COGAT as our screener for identifying gifted and talented students when they come into school. We can't use that right now in the fall. So we are able to use this to identify our gifted and talented students. This does meet COMA requirements for that. So Ms. Smith is working uh, diligently on that to help identify the GT students based off of the scores that they have on their diagnostics. 
as I said before, I think a big thing to remember is that this provides acceleration and enrichment. It's not all about what kids aren't good at. It is really, if a student needs to work above level, this is gonna push them above their level. It's going to be something that pushes all students. Just, you're thinking that the enrichment is, there's more momentum in this. Well, I'm, what I'm saying is if, I, if I'm very strong in a particular math area, I may not be working at my grade level in math. I may be working two or three grade levels above at skills that are appropriate for that grade level. So it's, it's naturally built in to help students who are above. Well, my point is since we're not in schools and we don't have where we're pulling students out for enrichment, this is allowing them to do it on their own time. And I can't answer that we're not pulling them out to do additional stuff because we do have small group stuff that goes on the levels. But yes, I am saying that this is helping to create that enrichment possibility. Yes. Thank you. I would hope we... that a gifted and talented uh, student doesn't skip grades and gets beyond their maturity level. Uh, I speak from experience, not that I'm gifted and talented now, but. When you go into the 10th grade and you're 14, uh, that's a trauma. And that's a, I agree, that's a whole different story when you're doing it in the physical grade, where in the program itself, you're still in your grade, you're just working right. on your math in that grade level or you're reading in that grade level, so. What uh, do we do with the information when we find we have a gifted and talented? This is the only thing they can do to improve. We don't have any other no, right. So we have, so just like Mr. Um, Kentop just said, Ms. Smith sort of runs that gifted and talented program and those students do get opportunities for specialized instruction that is at their level. I would think on it would this, be useful on this program in only. Well, no, not just in this program. Some students, and you can come back up, Ms. Smith, but some students are in different novels. It depends on where they are demonstrating that giftedness in what content area, what area. Some are doing English language arts, some are in higher level math, so it just depends. Now, at elementary school, obviously, it looks a little bit different, um, but go ahead, Ms. Smith. So, uh, for the record again, I don't know if I need to state it again, Amy Smith, mathematics and gifted and talented supervisor. The program, so it won't accelerate them to be above and beyond and so they're going to come back and now all of a sudden a second grader is going to be sitting in a sixth grade math classroom or a sixth grade English language arts classroom. What it does is it provides them extensions and enrichments because it's not giving them all of the great content. It's giving them opportunities to grow in certain areas that they've shown um, great knowledge already. So it allows them a little bit more depth in their understanding. Uh, in, in the high school grades, uh, there's opportunity for advanced placement in college. So th that's a great way to uh, enhance that preparation. Absolutely, so it gives them, again, some of those extended building blocks for them, and then when they get into high school, they have lots of opportunities to be able to move themselves when it's um, developmentally appropriate. As far as um, it being the only place for our gifted and talented students to get enrichment, even though we are in a land of virtual, we are doing small groups virtually, as well as there are some small groups that are being brought in. And as we increase our numbers, some of that may be focused right around bringing in some of our GT learners as well. So they're having opportunities beyond just the program to do enrichments and extended explorations with their teachers. The teachers are doing a phenomenal job job at differentiating so that students at all different levels in their learning have opportunities to be able to extend if they're showing some real advancements in one area they can extend here and then they struggle a little bit here that's within the teachers capacity and there they work very well at doing that and I've already um, talked with several of the teachers about some of their small groups where they had pulled a few of their students that were doing very well and they put in an added enrichment for me specifically. They've talked to me about mathematics, so I'm sure that they're also doing that with their language arts students as well. Thank you for You're bringing welcome. that up, appreciate it. And they're bringing them into the building. So right now, I'm not sure if any of the small GT groups. small groups have been brought in yet. Um, but we know that we have some small groups that have started this week in the schools. Um, so schools have been working with small groups of students. So I imagine that that's probably one of the groups that'll get, that'll start in the near future. Okay, thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Smith. The, the last two benefits, I just want to touch base real quick. I use a lot of fancy words in this one, provides a skill-specific supplemental resource for students to increase proficiency. Basically, sometimes kids struggle with just one skill. They don't struggle with the entire subject. So if I struggled with just working on characterization, I don't necessarily need a full intervention for reading. This program allows me to get the skill-specific help instead of just a blanket help. And, and I think that's a huge advantage for our students. And the last thing that this program does is, is the Maryland Ready to Read Act. This year, Board of Education were required to have a diagnostic screener for kindergarten students to make sure that they're not at risk uh, for difficulties in foundational reading skills. And this program meets those criteria. So we're, we're meeting Maryland requirements for this, for gifted and talented, and for our reopening uh, plan. So uh, this has multiple multiple pieces. So now we open it up to any additional questions you might have. And as I said, the supervisors are here in case you have content specific questions for anything. Mr. Smith. Students, when we have face to face, it's tough times to communicate with students. But when you're distant, some students are probably either lack of internet or lack of family support, aren't probably anticipating as much as we'd like. When we get back to full time or AABB days shortly, what can we do about that? Because some of these kids are coming, I just think, you know, behind. I know we're doing this gap testing, but we're not reaching all of them, or, or are we reaching most of them? I, I can't, I don't have the numbers to know uh, from right. a system standpoint. So every student is going to have this assessment, right? So all of them, we're gonna diagnose all of them to see where they are. And as a normal part of teacher's instruction, they start to fill in those gaps by differentiating instruction when they have their students. So this won't be any different from that. Will they probably have more students that are experiencing some gaps? Probably so, but for a teacher to differentiate their instruction based on those gaps, that is not unusual. That's something that they do all the time. Right, but it just it's more extended right now with distant learning, I would think. Well, we had to have a platform, as you can see, was one of the requirements. We had to have a platform in which we could gauge that gap, and that is different for us. And then the other thing is, we mentioned that our staff being trained, uh, one number had 121 sessions, 60. Are all our teachers been trained in this? Uh, not every teacher was trained. At the middle school and the high school level, there was no need to train science, social studies, unified arts teachers, so we focused on the reading and the math teachers. At the elementary level, everyone teaches reading and math, so we tried to uh, we tried to open that to as many as we could. I cannot promise you that every teacher was trained because the sessions, we had a limit on them because it's hard to get questions and interactions if you have 60 people in a, in a session, but we did have enough sessions that I think we hit a majority in every school. I mean, because I'm just, in fairness to teachers, it, this is all new to all of us. It is, some and, some and of them worked in the summer during our um, recovery programs. They were trained in exact path prior to that, so they didn't come to this training because they were working with it over the summer. So I, I would say we were pretty close to everybody that is using this has been trained. Ms. Kelly, Captain Kelly. It just, the, um, the assessments in high school, they may not have English until second semester, so they're not going to get assessed early on in the school year, right? That's what you were just talking yeah. about. Yeah, we, ha we have to um, make a determination on that. Actually, Ms. Forbes has been trying to communicate with MSD on that because that is a point of contention in multiple systems that have semesterized high school classes. And we're waiting to get a, a, a clear answer on if we have to do a different assessment or do they have to still take it even though they're not in an English class and we just have to have that data. We, we, we don't have a clear answer on that yet. Okay. The other question I have is on the, um, the last bullet you had of the when we're beginning the school year with a diagnostic screener for kindergarten students. Is is this the actual kindergarten assessment we're making then? What I know we have a whole yep. kindergarten so we assessment. have Mrs. McNeil with us. I'm going to ask her to come forward. And yes, this is the assessment that we're using for kindergarten, yeah, and they've okay. already started. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure Actually, before school started, yeah. they had made appointments in some of the schools for mm -hmm. students to come in and start working on this before okay. students returned. Um, Michelle McNeil, Supervisor of Early Learning. So kindergarten students, we did, um, this meets our Maryland requirements for the Maryland Ready to Read Act, which is uh, um, Senate Bill 734, that we had to have a screener to identify students for reading difficulties. Um, we decided as a school system 
that um, we wanted because this gives us such reliable data for our kindergarten students and we weren't able to do KRA this year due to virtual learning that we asked for um, our kindergarten students to be brought to the school and assessed with the classroom teacher during conferences times during the first week of school so that we could get accurate results um, as Mr. Kintop shared you know sometimes at the home the parents want to help and we really wanted to use this assessment to really get a good idea where our um, students are in kindergarten so um, we have a lot of that data back and our reading specialists are working with the teachers to analyze the data and um, we're required to um, send letters out to our parents to let them know if their student has been identified with a reading difficulty and what supplemental resources or instruction that we will provide them um, during that time. Great. So, Neil, congratulations and thank yes. you for being with us. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? This is more set. I don't have a question. I just think it's pretty cool. This actually follows the testing actually follows the same logarithm some of the um, certification tests take. Mm -hmm. uh, it's progressive in its difficulty and it'll back back down when you start getting some of those questions wrong. So they'll be facing the same thing if they get certified in anything. So it, 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 they'll be familiar with the platform or the, the logarithm, I guess. You say. And, and honestly, the students don't necessarily see that end of it. You know, there's a lot that I showed you. They, they don't know that it's going up and down. They're just getting a question. This one seems harder. This one seems easier. But it's the background that's trying to find the right spot for them. Mm -hmm. Mr. Anderson. I think the beauty of that is it's individualized. And uh, it works sort of behind the curtain. And there's a learning curve for deficiency without calling it deficiency. And it's building one, as you say, blocks. I think it's terrific. I mean, if students don't get any of the, the, the information and says you were at this level for this, it, it just creates a learning path and it gets them started on their learning path. So yes, it, it, it's, and we're not keeping anything from them, it's just putting them at the level where they need in those skills. Something like this was done 65 years ago, but it, they just assessed where people were at the moment. Mm -hmm. And then they got put into situations and half of them didn't make it. The unfortunate ones did. <laughs> so my question is, so the gap data, we'll be able to have real time on that? Once the students finish the diagnostic, the data is, is available to teachers. And, and we'll share, we'll share. No, I'm just saying this is fabulous for the students to be able, you know, right away, this is, you know, seeing what happened in March and, you know, how we ended in June, um, this is great to know this now. Yeah, and, and from an instructional side of things, if a student is in eighth grade math working on something and they're struggling with a skill that's not necessarily in the eighth grade curriculum, mm -hmm. yeah, this is allowing them to get that work to help bridge that gap for them while they're still able to keep up with their eighth grade curriculum with their teacher. I, I, I think that's a huge benefit to this too. It is huge. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Kentop. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Kentop. So now uh, we have 2.03, the update on Queen Anne's County Public Schools recovery and reopening plan. Just had that. No, it's not. Thank you all. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Mr. Kentuck. Okay, so today I will be providing an update on our recovery and reopening plan. Much of what you're going to see in the beginning is the same information that you've already seen. It's, it's the same. Uh, our recovery plan and, and requirements from MSDE, there were 13 requirements. I'm not going to go all, over all of them because we've had this information shared with us 
previously, but I would like to say that we have gotten feedback from MSDE on all of the requirements. I'll go over some of that in just a moment. Now, what we're looking at right now, and what parents are looking to hear is any updates that relate to what we're gonna be doing uh, moving forward. So I would like to let everyone know that um, in this presentation, there is that guidance, that COVID-19 guidance for um, Maryland schools that is hyperlinked, so parents should go to this document and they can click on that. There are some new health metrics and guidelines and benchmarks uh, related to COVID-19 positivity rates and case rates as of Friday, but I, this information is as of Friday, but I would like to tell you that about 15 minutes before I walked into this meeting, I got yet another update from our nurse supervisor, which I'll share with you in just a moment. So when I, sp I spoke with Dr. Ciatola, our health director for Queen Anne's County, and he gave me some stats on Friday. Uh, our Queen Anne's County seven day positivity rate was 4.7. And of course we know that we have to have it 5% or less uh, in order to continue to uh, meet with our students. For the seven day case rate was 9.9% and it has to be within five to 15% in order for us to continue to meet with students. I'm gonna share a little bit about that in just a moment. Our district recovery plan was reviewed uh, by MSDE over the last few weeks and there will be some revisions that we're gonna make. One of them having to do with the platform for taking attendance. Uh, thankfully at this point we do have uh, Schoology as we were creating that plan, our language reference that we were going to have Schoology um, and, power, and Power School also we use to take attendance. So now we do have that and we'll make sure that we do that update for our submission. There was another request that we include uh, specifically the topics or the content areas for our um, um, our um, UA courses. So we need to say that is music and art and media and some cases computer lab. Uh, so we just have to spell that out. Those are the kinds of revisions that we need to make and we'll submit them by Friday. The state board will see all plans or, or a summary of all plans at their board meeting next week and ours will be in there with our Provisions. Small group instruction is underway, as you know, and some of the updates that were in the state superintendent's last press release, they still stand. Just as a reminder, we have to have 180 days of school. All schools have to have a total of six hours per day, and that includes synchronous and asynchronous, to be clear on that. Schools have to have an average of 3.5 hours across grades K through 12 of synchronous instruction spread out over the course of the day. Half day pre-K has to have a minimum of 1.5 hours of synchronous instruction and school systems that have indicated they, that they aren't returning to school in person until the second semester are asked to reevaluate their reopening plans by the end of the first quarter uh, or the first marking period. And that's falling right around the third week in November. Of course, we do updates every two weeks, so we are certainly following all of those requirements. Now, let me just go back for a moment. Where we um, know that we would need to make a revision is on that third bullet, and where it says that schools have to have an average of 3.5 hours across the grade, grade levels. That is for five days a week. And so currently, we have Wednesdays as a virtual day for everyone except for our CTE kids, um, and, and CTE as far as courses that are in industry certification courses at that. So we would need to make a revision for that. Now the question at hand, which everyone is looking for a response to, is whether or not we are going to open at 50% capacity. Now this slide is gonna to talk with you about a proposal. So on our October 7th um, board meeting, I am going to make a recommendation that we open schools at 50% capacity right around mid-October. That's gonna give us enough time to rework bus routes. It's gonna give us enough time to adjust our staffing 
shopping plans and get everything together that we need to get together. And some of the items that I've listed here are things that we need to work on in order to do so. So we need to be sure that we are following the health metrics that have been put before us. That seven day positivity rate less than 5% and that seven day case rate between 5 and 15%. As I mentioned, about 15 minutes before I came into this meeting this afternoon, and you may have gotten it, um, Mrs. Morissette, there has been an adjustment from the CDC recommending that we move from the seven day rate to the 14 day rate. So I haven't had a chance to go through all of it, but it just came to me about 4.45 this afternoon. So that would be a change that we would need to make. And you know, as we continue to learn, as I've always said, as we get information, we'll continue to make those adjustments based on the information that we get. We just have to uh, remember that this is ever changing and these kinds of things happen. So I have seven day up here, but it is likely going to change to 14 day. What the process will be is on Fridays, Ms. Um, Fellers, our nurse supervisor, will have conversation with members of the health department and they will, and she will get the positivity rate and the case rate from the health department. And what we had planned to do was on Friday, there would be communication to families as to whether or not we are okay based on these two health metrics to have face-to-face -face instruction for the following week. Now I have to say it helps us if it actually is 14 days because then parents aren't sitting on the edge of their seats on Friday trying to figure out what to do come Monday. So we will have two weeks instead of one week, but we will be abiding by that 14 day positivity rate and case rate. Another place that we have to make some adjustments is for the A day, B day or A day or A week, B week schedule. It cannot have a virtual Wednesday as the hybrids show in the recovery plan right now. So we will just roll A day, B day, A day, B day, or A week, B week. However, um, our teams um, are going to you know, make that recommendation and some work definitely does have to be done um, on a lot of these areas in order for us to make a, a strong recommendation and be ready for October the 7th. So that's something that we have to work on. Parents will have the option. This is a question a lot of families have. Whether, may I still keep my child home um, even if you go back to school? So the answer will be yes. We will still allow families to um, have their kids participate only in virtual instruction if that is their choice. That impacts the next bullet significantly. School hours. So now what we have to consider is that if we are going to have children at home learning as well as in schools learning, our teachers have got to have time to adequately plan instruction, communicate back and forth with those students who are going to be at home learning um, and those parents. And it's not going to happen in 15 minutes. So that likely means that we will not have a regular six and a half hour day of instruction for our students. We may have to back down on that number to allow teachers an opportunity to do their planning and to converse with and, and meet with those students who are only learning at home. So that is one thing that we definitely need to work on. Um, now there's the issue of temperature checks. Uh, at present, we're looking at 100.4. Um, anything less than that, if it's more, then that is going to be a no-go for face-to-face -face instruction. And the change has been made from 72 hours without a fever to 24 hours without a fever in order to return to school. Now one thing that we have to consider is that in order for our health officer, our health department to feel comfortable with this 50% capacity in schools and on school buses is the recommendation which several parents have alluded to about this temperature scan. And that would mean that there would need to be temperature scans before students board the bus. Well, as you know, Bus drivers are not getting out of that seat to stand at that door to board buses. So that presents an opportunity for us perhaps to bring back, yes, all of our five hour pairs, but they would have to ride the bus so that they could help assist with that temperature screening. Now, 
what happens if there's a child who screens 100.6 and they're at the bus stop and there's no parent and now we are looking at sending possibly a sick child back home and maybe the parent's gone, maybe the parent's not. So these are things that we have to work diligently with our community and with our teams about and ensuring that there is a plan because if we're going to put those buses at 50% capacity, and I would argue that we absolutely have to have buses at 50% capacity if we're going to open schools at 50% capacity. So those are the types of details that we need time to work on with our, our, for our families. Um, and then of course there are the issues of staffing. So some of our teachers are currently working from home and able to do so for a variety of reasons, some of them for medical reasons. Um, some teachers have you know those conditions which their doctors have said you need to be at home. So now what do we do? If we're gonna bring back children at 50% capacity and now I have teachers who are unable to come back. So that's gonna require some reworking for us. So this is not something that we could flip a dime and say, okay, let's just open the doors wide open and have everybody come back. It doesn't work that way. So that staffing issue is something else that we need to work out. Then there, of course, there is the issue of athletics. What do we do about athletics? Um, as you know, we're gonna talk about athletics a little bit later and I know that I have Mr. Harding um, behind me and he will be here for questions. But these are some of the things that we are working through over the next three um, weeks to be prepared for a, a solid recommendation for you on October 7th. And I think the temperature check, the 24 hours without fever is with no Tylenol ibuprofen. Correct. Naturally no fever. Mm -hmm. Did I see your hand, Mr. Anderson? Go right ahead. Well, this is more confusing to implement than the hybrid. And the hybrid was costly and, in my view, very difficult to handle. A child shows up and has a temperature. What the heck are we going to do about that? We, yeah. we can't leave a child at the bus stop, yeah. particularly if we've told the parent that you know, the child is going to be in school. Nobody's done a budget uh, uh, calculation. I'm sure that'll be showing up. Extra manpower, uh, buses running at half uh, capacity. What about the teacher? The teacher doesn't get the day off to catch up on uh, lesson planning and so forth. So the teachers that are face-to-face -face will not be available for virtual training because they're already gonna be dealing with their own kids. unless. They're using the same format. They are. And so the, the notion would be that teachers are teaching synchronously and, um, you know, virtually face to face at the same time. Yeah. So, so that, that is the notion. And, and, you know, your concern is very valid. And, of course, I just mentioned it as a concern. And it's certainly something that we would have to work out, uh, which is why we can't just say, let's just do it right now, because we just aren't ready is for somebody, that. Has anybody else started a program like this that we know of? So we do have several districts in our state that are also looking at opening at 50% capacity. Let them first and see how it works. And some of them will be opening before us. <laughs> Some of the smaller ones? Yes. Okay. And one larger. Okay. Oof. And you might, you, this is where the, the, the parents have brought forward that the bus issue, they're ready to help. So yes, maybe and that's some great. specific um, you know, guidance to them. You know, maybe if it's a little one, parent has to be there when they get on the bus. I mean, unless they're sure. Those, the those are definitely yeah. things that we need to work out. But what I do want to say to you, Captain Kelly, is we cannot rely on all parents to take all kids who can't because we have ser several areas in our county where that okay. offer, it doesn't look like it looks in some other areas. Totally agree. But yeah. there's, there's quite a few in other areas. So the numbers might work out. We'll, so we'll, we will see. What we need to wor first worry about is when the CDC is going to allow us to have 50% on the buses the governor has given us well the governor and I have personally asked the question right I have not gotten a response back right. so different districts are doing it in different ways we are relying on some guidance from our health department and our health department would be comfortable with 50 percent capacity on buses if we do temperature scans 
prior to uh, prior to students boarding the bus. Okay. But not every bus has the same amount of children at 50 percent. Aren't they different? That's sizes? correct. That's correct. So and so it'll be 50 percent capacity for whatever that bus is. I, uh, with all due respect to parents, uh, even if they signed a legal document, stuff happens, and you know, if they have. Uh, you, you, you're, you're, you're talking to the choir, Mr. Anderson. We're all on the same page. But even in the past, there's been busing issues at 100%. I mean, that is, a, I mean, in, in Queen Anne's County, I think we're 100% bust. I mean, we have very few students that walk that to school. Correct. I mean, we're not, you know, I mean, typical example of Centerville. You have Northbrook, which is too far away from any school to walk. Um, and that's, and that's, there's some challenges here. And I think we're gonna have to have the public help us. I think with these temperature checks, it's a, it's a challenging issue. But there's got to be some responsibility of parents too, that you know, you, you know, if we test a child and they can't get on a bus, especially to smaller children, it's an issue. We got to be creative and think of some good options for that. We and also have to remember it's challenging. we're getting ready to go into flu season, the old school flu season. Mm -hmm. So that is going to be an issue on top of yeah, the doing a temperature check might be flagging other things that may have slipped under the radar. And they're developing a strep throat. They've got pink eye. And, and we know that not all people who carry the virus exhibit symptoms. Yeah, right. at very all. symptomatic. Yeah. Correct. Right. But for, to alleviate your concern a little, Mr. Mr. Anderson, like like Mr. Smith said, we have bus issues all the time. Anyhow, I mean, I rode buses. I rode some buses and and they couldn't drop the kids off out of the bus because the parent wasn't there, um, little ones. And so they took them back to school. I mean, they make up for it. It isn't like a bus situation is perfect. But that's with no, all but this. people. Yeah. Uh, that's with what? Going at the same schedule, being picked up at the same day and so forth. If certain, well, we're arguing the same thing over and we over are. again. No. It's, it's round robin right now. No. We're all okay. the same. No. Okay. We, no. we all understand our issues. I, we had a parent today, actually, and, and his concerns, which will all be addressed, hopefully, you know, about cleaning the schools, health screening. Uh, if a child is infected, where do they go? Um, contact tracing. If the teachers aren't, are sick, will the, you know, t the children be notified? Uh, what are the consequences if the children don't wear masks? I mean, there are, these are all things that have to be addressed before we can have any more students in. Yep. Right. And you know, so. not, to, not to make light of it at all, but these are things that absolutely have to be considered. There are all kinds of memes and things out there and all kinds of sayings right now about kids who don't wear masks or won't wear a mask or the probability of being able to keep the mask on a, a five-year-old, right. right? These are things that we have to consider. Right. So, so when we talk about opening schools at 50% capacity, that's the reality. And, and the reality is that Queen Anne's County and every other district in the state of Maryland and everywhere else in the United States is likely to have someone contract COVID-19 in a school when we open at 50% capacity. So we have to think about that. Probability is very high. And the school shuts down, so that affects everybody that Most was in The school doesn't shut down. The whole school doesn't shut down. Okay, we need to get all that straight on the next. It could. Meeting. But it's it, absolutely, that possibility. absolutely. Possible, because one case right. could shut a school down. One case may not shut the whole district down. Right. That's but, what I thought he was saying. Where school system shut down. I mean, no. No. And then they're doing a disservice to that school by shutting it down and not everyone else. I mean, we're so it's that is you know that's that's the likelihood. Mm -hmm. But thankfully, we, we do have the capacity to continue instruction face-to-face -face or virtually. Um, so th those are things that I just want to bring to the attention of the public, to your attention, that have to be considered and well thought out, and it will not happen in five days or seven days, whether, you know, whether we you know, are pleased with that or not. It is the reality. So getting in that same vein, um, Dr. Kane, we had 
discussed back on September 2nd how all of our masks and our cleaning sanitizing equipment was not here yet. Oh, yeah. So I don't know if that was in part of this next presentation or am I jumping the gun? Well, yeah, you're jumping just okay, a little I'll, bit, okay, but I'll, 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 I'll be sure to respond to that and then I'll get my um, okay, I'll, I'll, my no. colleague, Mrs. Pullen, to come to. So we'll let me, just, um, no worries, because that's going to come up. Okay. There were some questions about grants that support the COVID-19 um, purchases that we have to make. So we do have um, several. I'm going to talk about five of them right now. And uh, let me switch my page so I can make sure that I'm in the right place. Dr. King, before you move on, I sure. just want to say thank you very much. Um, I'm really You're happy welcome. about this. And the other thing is I'm happy that you, the, all the work that was done before by the Tiger teams, a lot of these these issues are sitting there, you know, ready to be worked on. Some of so. this is absolutely sitting in Tiger teams' work, and some of it we have to go back to the drawing board. So, say for example, with the schedules, mm -hmm. we created a, a BB schedules with that Wednesday in between. Now we've gotten information that we can't have that week Wednesday in between. Yeah. So we have to go back to the drawing board, and then when we go back to the drawing board, we have to look at how many hours can we feasibly be in school when teachers have additional responsibilities. Mm -hmm. We have got to make sure that they have the time. So it won't be a full day, but how many hours? Right. You know, so they still have So we're have well some, on the way is yes. what I'm saying. We are not starting work from scratch. Before. That was great. We are not starting from scratch. Thank right. you. So the first grant that I'm going to talk about is the GEAR grant. It's the Governor Emergency Education Relief Fund, um, and that's in the amount of 51600 approximately. And that grant allows us to fund technology related to virtual learning. That's what that one is for. The funds have to be expended by September 2022, and we use these funds to purchase extended data plans for hotspots. Uh, we also provided equitable services to our non-pubs um, partners so that they could purchase technology as well. The broadband grant, that is for 708000 It has to be expended by December of this year, 2020. Those funds are provided to assist in the implementation of projects that um, provide broadband services to unserved students. So for those students who do not have access to the internet or who have uh, unreliable access to the internet, and we, of course, purchase uh, more hotspots and data plans um, with most of those dollars. The next one, um, there are two that are CARES um, grants. One is for tutoring and one is for technology. This is the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act. Um, and what you have to know is that they both are need, um, due by December 2020. We have to expend the funds by then. The tutoring grant is for approximately $395,600. And we use those dollars to purchase our learning management system, school uh, we also funded professional learning for teachers centered on Schoology. Um, we purchased um, transportation or we paid for transportation over the summer months for the transporting of learning materials associated with the school closures. On For the technology grant, the amount of $858,000, about $400, that was used to purchase mobile hotspots, um, accompanying data plans, webcams for every teacher so that they can teach kids in their class and at home as well, uh, Chromebooks for first and second grade, also third grade, switched out some funds there. We purchased flash drives for distance learning. Um, we paid for postage for those learning packets that we did over the summer and for any that we have to continue to do right now. Are you saying we've already spent all that money or? Pretty much, yeah. So this the, is these were, the CARES dollars were some of the first dollars that we got. So the 600 webcams, does that cover uh, most of the classrooms? <clears throat> yes, that covers all teachers. Oh, it awesome. does. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There was all some, classroom uh, teachers. I think I understand the decision, but uh, the Supreme Court said since the CARES money was not designated as ti Title I money, mm -hmm. uh, the money that was received has to be shared with private schools. That is correct. And what does that mean to the budget if uh, uh, private schools say, Wait, we didn't get our money, the public school system did, and we have to give money back? Well, it's not going to impact our operating budget because remember, this is a grant. Right, so this is a grant, and part of the grant approval process is that we identify those non-pubs and the dollar amount that, that we share with them. That is Title I money. 
It's this is one. this is not Title One money. Well, Grants. Uh, it's a federal would, grant, but yeah, it's not Title One. Somebody look at the Supreme Court decision to make sure we haven't spent money we got to give back. No, we have not. Okay. Yeah. So that is, to my count, 3,200 hotspots we've purchased so far between all these grants. Or um, is this over? I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's probably somewhere around 2,400. It, it may it may be to 32. 28. Okay, I'm just looking at the 3,200 here and 2,400 in broadband and then another 400 in CARES. So is that overlapping okay. in some of the same devices? No, that's okay. so that, that's that's probably right. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. What we ended up doing was switching out for devices. So where we fell short in our operating budget for devices, mm -hmm. we were able to pick that up here. Okay. Right. So that we didn't have that two hundred thousand dollar hole, which we mm -hmm. which remember that one yep. that we had. So we were able to pick that up here. So all of our first, second, and third graders, and in fact, we are um, creating a plan to try to get some devices in the hand of our kindergarten students as well. We've gotten some emails and I'll respond to that because I saw the look on your face, Mr. Anderson. We've gotten some, and I've spoken with some teachers as well, some emails uh, that they would be quite pleased if we could put some devices in the hands of our kindergartners simply because of the learning management system um, and the work that can be assigned to them and we can alleviate some of that back and forth. I, I right thought, now. Yeah, I thought some of the third graders or second graders got, or first graders, got new ones and maybe some of the ones that they turned in could be used. Well, uh, we're, we're going to make sure that they yeah. that they get that they get new ones. It was our decision initially that we would not put students at that young age behind those devices, but as it turns out, it would be more um, it would be better for our families as well as our students if we didn't have students who had to rely on their parents' device because parents are home and using their devices, um, but not to have them behind it for four hours a day. So, so that's what that changes. Is it a Chromebook about. or is it some other like an iPad or something else? We're we're still working on that. I spoke with some um, specialists who said that if it was whatever the device is, as long as it had a touch screen. Okay. Hmm. And would it be a mix of device and manipulatives? Oh, they absolutely have manipulatives. In fact, a lot of them have been gone, have gone home already. Good. They had them packed up and ready to go from everything from Play-Doh to crayons and instruments to measure and count, and okay. they had all of those. In fact, at Centerville Elementary School, they boxed up all of their things and sent them home in pizza boxes. Oh. Yeah, cool. some had, uh, in some schools they had little tiny little backpacks, but uh, Centerville, they got creative and they sent them home in pizza boxes, so. Our Chromebook's still on path order. I know that, but middle of October, you still think? Yep. Uh. Everything yep. is I understand, going but I mean, order. it's still no major delays. I know it's a delay now, but October, middle of October looks like County a. County October, yep. Um, so those are those, those are the things that we um, spent our dollars on. But let me get to the tutoring. So, and I think I might have said something about tutoring already, Schoology and PD. But I stopped at the technology piece. Um, I think I did say all of the technology mm -hmm. piece. So got that. Yes. But we, but also we do support our non-publics with these CARES dollars as well. What's that mean? That means we have a portion of these CARES dollars that we have to share with our non-publics that have, um, and I think we have about four of them that responded, that have students that can benefit from these dollars. So um, purchasing devices is okay. what they're doing because that's what these dollars are for. Okay. What, do we have the total amount of that? Um, I can get it for you Not on tonight, that computer yeah. up there. I don't have it on this one, but here, but I can get it for you. They have to be, don't they have to be title one? They have to be. There's, there's an income, uh, right. there's a funding income. formula. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. So the last grant that I'll talk with you about is the ESSER grant. And that one uh, has to be expended by uh, September 2022 as well. Now, this one is also for technology. So we were able to move some dollars from out of this grant because this one, you may remember, had much more technology than it has now, but then we got 
another grant that came through at a later date. So we moved dollars out of this one. This was one of the earliest grants we got. So when we started getting those CARES grants over the summer, we moved some items from the, this grant to that one. So this one, the biggest expenses that we incur in cleaning and sanitizing and that type of equipment comes from this grant. Recall that the county had gotten some dollars and we were not a part of that. So we were able to move some dollars around, take some technology out of here, move it to the technology grant and use this one for cleaning, sanitizing supplies. Uh, we do have the installation of the wireless access points here at Mentum, um, the exact path that you just heard about, some curriculum online learning platforms. We also um, use this grant to fund stipends for our COVID-19 safety training for our support staff, nursing supplies, bus operations over the school closures to move supplies around, um, athletics expenses, and of course those same equitable services for our non-publics come out of this grant. This sanitizing, is this that the one um, that, that Mr. Penner talked about, and they can quickly go through a room and yes, and we received all that? No, so that's also, everything's on back order, back so order, we anticipate okay. that we'll have that in probably the next 10 days, uh, which does not impede cleaning right now, it's just that those uh, devices make it a lot faster. Right, you can for, cover more ground, if we did it the uh, eight, more eight. quickly. Um, I'm going to ask probably my colleague to, to come sit up here with me for just a moment. So we would probably have enough sanitation of what we ordered for opening schools, hopefully in October. Ab absolutely. Schools okay. absolutely that have supplies right now. Okay. So uh, they have hand sanitizers. Of course, they have soap, paper, towels, plastic liners for trash cans, water bottle filling stations. Uh, teachers have, we have face coverings. We have, um, you know, tissues, gloves. We've got. You had that plexiglass they, they bought all that plexiglass? Yes, too, the plexiglass it? is currently being installed. So oh, we've okay. covered all of the main offices as well as the nurses stations. We'll now be moving on to cafeterias and uh, the cashier stations for uh, for our food service workers as well. Are they going to go in the classrooms too? No, at this point there are some plexiglass barriers that are be being used between students specifically with some of our small populations that are currently in the building, but as a standard it's not typically something that we'll use in classrooms. That will be six feet of social distancing as well as mask use and then good hand hygiene as well. As well. Ms. Pullen, thank you for being with us tonight and congratulations. Thank you, thank you for taking over. We appreciate it everything that you do before and really now truly Thank you. appreciate it i appreciate so the what confidence. we have in the schools right now is enough to take care of the small group instructions that we have going on currently yes, that's correct what we really have to wait on and what i my point i was getting to earlier is that we have to wait for the bulk of it so that we could get to 50 percent capacity you know because extra masks and you know and extra gloves and it's going to be Schools do have, it's be they have a, a big supply of yes. gloves and masks, so we aren't waiting for any of that. Okay. No. So we can carry on with instruction and we continue to order. So schools are not waiting for masks or gloves or hand sanitizer. Mm -hmm any of that they already have that okay and one of the good things is that now that we have small groups in the buildings for instruction we're also seeing the rate of use so some of the things such as disposable gowns and masks and hand sanitizers that we're not sure exactly how fast we're going to go through we're starting to see that so it'll give us a little bit better efficiency on when and how to order so we can stay ahead of it okay thank you very much okay. all right Okay, so we, you already had an update on Schoology, but uh, I did include the slide so that you could see the professional development, uh, and, and it is ongoing. So just to reiterate, just for a moment, we're taking this in phases. Right, so we didn't open up every app, everything at one time. It's enough of a learning curve, and we want to give teachers an opportunity to get solid on some of the beginning things before we start to open up all of those other things. And I think that we mentioned that we have to vet all of those, even though you know they are integrated. We have to vet them because sometimes there is. Um, we have to be sure of the security, the student uh, data security, and we have to make sure that we are uh, complete 
complying with our own policies as far as that goes before we open some of those apps. So one step at a time, and this is just, we continue to step it out in phases uh, and we continue to do professional learning with our teachers. And, and I would like to say to, to all of our teachers, if you are having difficulty, there are a number of places that you go for support. First, you, you certainly can go to first your Schoology teacher leader um, in your building. And that's the first step. If you are still having difficulty, then you reach out to any of the um, contacts that we just shared with you. It, it may be um, Renee Wolf, it may be um, Debbie Terry, it just depends on what level you are. And you certainly can reach out to Mr. Page or Mrs. Forbes. We are here to support you. Uh, nobody wants us to have our teachers struggling, but this is a learning curve. So what I had to say to a couple of teachers is give yourself a break, right? Give yourself a break. It is going to be okay. You have to learn it just like you learn anything else and you will get used to it. It's, it's not a situation where if we complain enough, it's gonna go away. It is not gonna go away. We have to get trained and we have to get ourselves accustomed. So give yourself a little bit of a break and take some of that pressure off and we'll, we'll definitely work with our teachers to make sure that they have what they need. And, and the parents and the students too. I and mean, the parents and the everybody. students as well. Just yep, so everybody take a deep breath. Uh, if, if kids are crying at home, back them away from the computer for a minute. Back away, it's okay. Let them, it's more important that we wrap our arms around our children while we're transitioning here and ensure that we're supporting our teachers as we transition and our families. So we'll make sure that we do that. Um, transportation, this is the same slide you saw last time. There is no change here. Uh, just want to reiterate that, um, you know, we are continuing on the same path as we are right now for small groups. And we will continue to work on the 50% capacity in order to come to you with a recommendation for October the 7th. So right now. How many do you have in the small groups? I, I just wanted a description of who they are, wh who went into school. How many you have? Do we do you have that information? I don't have it right in front of me, but there are several hundreds of, of hundreds. children. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And just to give you a little bit of, uh, I can answer that from a transportation group. Our uh, staff in the transportation department was very kind to pull this for me today. Right now we have 73 regular bus routes that are currently running. We have 14 special needs buses that are currently running. And those are their typical routes that they would typically see through a year, um, but just with smaller groups of students, those that have been invited back. So are, are there generally, how many numbers are in the schools? Um, you know, I wanted to get an idea of how many, you have 100 in a school, in each school? Easily. It greatly yeah. varies. Yeah, it, it absolutely varies. Obviously, high schools have will have larger numbers than everybody else, and Sudlersville Elementary School has a pretty large population because they are continuing from their summer program. So a good number, several hundred students, or more than 100, probably about 120 or yes. so at Sudlersville Elementary all by itself. Which is already the 50 percent, almost the 50 percent. Exactly. And Yes, and keeping in mind that they are going on Monday, Tuesday, and then Thursday, Friday. So that group is also split in half as well, so that we're still maintaining all of the necessary social distance. Just and they group. actually did that during the summer, the same amount of kids, and we didn't have any cases come out of that? It wasn't the same number of students. It was a much smaller group of students mm -hmm. um, for the summer school program. Um, they've had many more that they were able to invite back. For different reasons. Yes. Okay. So what are we doing about, with our buses right now? I know Mr. they're Smith. limited to smaller numbers. With Mr. Testing, Smith. Do we test them at the school or do we test them, do we test them at the school or do we test them when they get on the buses? Do you mean test in terms of uh, temperature? I'm oh, sorry. At this point, we've not been required to do that because of the small number, we're keeping them six feet apart. They're sitting every other seat. So therefore, it's not necessary per CDC guidelines to do that at this time. So once we move to one per seat, then that that's would be when the time it'd be required. Yes, yes, the health officer has asked that. Like in Sublersville, where we have maybe 100 students or something, 
do we check at that school just to see or we just we haven't been required to do that. That was required of us during summer school. Mm -hmm. We haven't been required to do that per, again, CDC guidance and also that through the health officer to do that. Um, we do have the nursing staff that's there and ready to mobilize at any time. They have lots of new equipment that makes them able to be more mobile and to get to the student as opposed to moving the student throughout the building. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of different checks and balances in place. So we have a way to monitor it, and if there was a positive or something, a way to do a find we out do. where we were. And yes, we also have isolation spaces that have been set up in all of the schools that will mm -hmm. allow for um, anyone who is showing symptoms mm -hmm. to then be placed in a, a specialty room until a parent can mm -hmm. come to pick them up. Yes. I mean, it's good. I guess it's kind of giving us a stepping stone to walk into the the, the more you know 50 percent it is it's, and you know, a little bit more of a comfort level as mm -hmm. well right. everyone is feeling a little more comfortable okay. so um, next we want to talk about inclement weather uh, we have not talked about that in any of the previous updates but now we're getting to be in that season where we could likely have a, a, a delayed opening or an early dismissal so we wanted to be sure that everyone is aware we did send school messenger um, messages home uh, probably Friday or, or over the weekend and so families do have this but we, we and we'll have our inclement weather presentation in October uh, but just wanted to get this out there that in the event of in inclement weather we will have virtual instruction for that day. So there's no need for a snow day or, or anything like that. Um, in the event that the inclement weather occurs on a Wednesday, and that's the day that our high schoolers are in for CTE courses, there are four cohorts. So it's sort of one, two, and then three, four in the afternoon. And what we do is cohorts one and two, if we have a uh, delayed opening, cohorts one and two obviously would attend school virtually and cohorts three and four would report to Queen Anne's County High School which is where they're going uh, for their regularly regu uh, regularly scheduled time we of course will offer lunch at that time and um, all other students obviously cohorts one and two will be in school virtually now in the event that inclement weather causes us to close schools early then cohorts one and two will already have been in school so they'll be dismissed at 1 11 15 and then cohorts three and four, the afternoon groups, they will attend school virtually. So we'll make sure that we get that information out to parents as soon as, as we get it. So just to be a devil's advocate on that, because you know how bad connectivity is now, we get a snowstorm, you know, what's the likelihood of having any connectivity? I'm just putting it out there because yeah. it's going to happen. And, and, and it is going to happen. Yeah. It, it, you know, it is absolutely going to happen. It might not have to be a snowstorm. It could be, heaven forbid, oh. you know, a bad storm or something. And, and that absolutely can happen. And if, and if we deem it necessary to say school is closed for the day, then we will say school is closed for the day. Okay. And we will have to adjust our calendar if we are required to do so. Okay. That's a good point. Uh, at what projection, because we now have the ability to virtually teach, at what point does it make no sense to have a day of school if we can teach that day with the students at home because it's snowing? Or, I guess a better way to put this, if there's a bona fide threat of a storm occurring at some time during Wednesday, just for instance, why don't we say on Tuesday we're going to teach virtually all day Wednesday and see how things develop? Look at the first bullet. That's what mm -hmm. I just want to repeat. Mm -hmm. uh, it would also suggest that if there was a threat, you wouldn't have anybody in the school, so the other dismissals wouldn't be necessary. If there's no one in the schools and, and, and the district has power, then we have virtual instruction. That's right, mm -hmm. which is the benefit of virtual instruction and proceeding with it. That is correct. Thank you, sir. And I think the one thing interesting with that in Queen Anne's County, we're one zone. So you, Ken Island is a very different area than Suttersville. And, you know, there's been times when somebody says, we don't have freezing weather down here on Ken Island, but up in Suttersville, it might have come north there. So, you know, there's all kinds of issues that are going to pop up the board as virtual than right now we've had in the last 50 years around here. I don't think you can... Uh, divide the county up into spaces, even though logically the weather might be 
cooler in no. Sudlersville. We, we have that. We, do. we so. have that. Well, one zone. I, 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 I wouldn't now. want to be the guy calling that shot. Well, well and you can't because for 50 some of your years. buses yeah, go both. Run we from, <laughs> at 5 o'clock right. in the morning. Yeah. We've you know, they're having to do that pass it. That's not working. That should be simplified. Well, wish everything was simplified. Athletics. Athletics. God bless. Yes, yes. So, first and foremost, um, you know, we are on currently a two semester plan. Um, and with that two semester plan, we're, which goes through the end of the first semester, January 29th, 2021, students are able to participate in virtual practices, um, um, in person conditioning, um, skill building sessions, sport specific practices, intramurals, intramurals, um, scrimmages. Uh, however, there is no actual competition. Um, and we have, and I'll, I'll bring my colleague, Mr. Um, Harding. Uh, up here just now so that he can speak to that as well. So there is no competition and we are right now pushing out a, uh, a model for virtual, um, virtual, I'm not going to call it coaching, but conditioning so that students have some pre prescribed um, work that they can do that's based on their own individual plan or group plans for students. I'm going to just go through this slide and then I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, and that, so that's for first semester. Second semester, you can see the dates February through June. We are looking at revising the, um, the seasons. So winter begins in February and that'll be for five weeks. Fall will be March um, through May. And you see that that is um, another five weeks. And then the spring season will be April through June, yet another other five weeks um, and that, that 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 does it for my competency in that area so we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to you mr. Hardy thank you so the hyperlinked MPSSAA two semester plan is simply the actual document that is on the MPSSA website they released I believe on Friday um, Concurrently with shutting down due to, due to COVID back in March um, MPSSAA and MSDE recommended that we be uh, really develop a local school system return to play committee. We've met as a committee twice and we are meeting again next week. Um, that committee looks at health matrix as they develop and really what, you know, CDC guidelines and what is available for our athletes to do. In the summer, as, as I'm sure you know, we did have uh, about a month, month and a half of non-sport specific conditioning at both high schools that went well. Uh, and then when the decision was to go virtual, we decided that um, really, and, and I think it is true that athletics should be, I would say, a half step behind the education. So, you know, uh, us in the athletic world are, are really waiting for the, the in-person learning to get up and running. And then I think everybody would feel most comfortable around um, actual athletics. Uh, that being said, we are developing and, and this local school system will, will help us tremendously. It, really the next step, which, which would be some version of a virtual platform, again, probably not right to call it coaching, but some sort of student engagement that would have some coaching pieces, but also look at um, social and emotional um, components as well. And our, our coaches hopefully would be able to interact with their, their students there. The reason to build the virtual component um, is that even as we go to a face-to-face -face more traditional practice, whether that's this semester later on or whether that's February 1st, uh, because MPSSA has stated that if things remain the way they are, we will begin a competition season, uh, three condensed seasons in February. Um, what the virtual component will allow us to do, and even a hybrid model there, will will be if we begin February 1st and, and something does kind of rise up, we're able to fall back to a virtual component or a hybrid component and our student athletes aren't left with all or nothing. So we're excited about that opportunity. It's a lot of work but we're, we're moving forward. Yeah, uh, working with the other school districts in order to create um, the schedules of, you know, basketball, football, lacrosse, ba I mean, just to name a few, it's gonna be daunting as it is to try and put five week sessions together. Yeah, so the two major concerns would be the um, travel schedule uh, and, and really the overlap between seasons. I, I, I do believe there's a, a way to do it. Um, there's been a lot of talk around it the smart way to the smart way right now it looks like would be you know if a if a student athlete is participating in the winter 
Um, there is going to be overlap between winter and fall, and therefore also between fall and spring. But that athlete, if they're competing, let's go with basketball, Ms. Harper, uh, if, they're, if they're on a basketball team, and then they're going to flow into our um, football team or you well, know, soccer team. My daughter's case, yep. she played three sports. So Correct. She, so they would be able to condition because they're volleyball, already volleyball, and then right into yep. softball. Yes, we have so, that problem. So they are already going to be conditioned from basketball. The coach w and the school would just need to set up a fair way to make sure that the, the selection of teams is in play. But in most cases, coaches have been doing ha coaches have been doing that for years because your most successful teams often go eight, nine, Correct. ten, fourteen days overlapping between seasons. Well, so it's we not. We also had states. Yep. We had state games, and I can remember. Our softball coach sitting there waiting for our basketball girls to get finished so they could start Absolutely. softball. So, yes, same thing happens. Then the lacrosse and, and, and uh, baseball, same thing. Correct. I have a question here, though. Um, on the, the first semester, though, is that what you're developing? The, the in, we're not doing this, you know, so the in-person conditioning, skill yes. building sports practices that's all you're going to be working that out so we're, we we're meeting like, with a local school system team which has uh miss fellers it has our health officer with it um mpssa released this it was either thursday or friday they use the term effective immediately but i think they even knew when they when you release it thursday friday it's unreasonable to expect the school system's going to be able to get to practices okay. um we're really looking at student engagement as much as possible so if it's safe to do so and it makes sense again i think starting virtually is a good step if we can get to in-person practice and, and scrimmages and it's because the health matrix are there, then, you know, it's, and the local school system uh, return to play team agrees, and obviously the superintendent agrees, we would then move forward. Well, here's a question. What if our health matrix are fine, but what if, like, Wycombe County or Worcester, who we're supposed to play, are not back in? I mean, th that we have to make the adjustments. It's just... Correct. So just, I, I had an athletic director's meeting for the entire Bayside Conference this morning, so the information okay. is kind of good. That would only impact us second semester when we actually begin the sports competition. First semester, if we say, and again, I'm not saying we're doing this, but just to give an example, if we said November 1st, we could begin in-person practice in Queen Anne's County, well, then we would have to just monitor the health matrix within our county. Okay. When we get into competition season, the, the, the conversation around the conference this morning was we would simply go to a North Bayside conference uh, regular season and a South and a South Bayside. So the hope there is limiting your geographical region. Perhaps you're limiting that because uh, right now I believe Wicomico County is over 7%. And so if we had them on our schedule, we would have to adjust. Either way, the tenor in the room this morning was we're going to do whatever we can. So if that means playing Queen Anne's for a third time instead of Wicomico, hey, that's okay. But you only have a five-week season, so really you should stay only North Bayside that we're yes. covering. The I'm other not, reason I, to, I'm yes. not telling you what to do. I just yep. know the other games. The other benefit to staying regionally like that is if it's very much up in the air whether MPSSA is, is going to be able to offer a, a championship postseason because that's the most highest risk because you're bringing everybody from around the state. Right. So the nice thing about that is if we stick, as we'll stick with the five week schedule, if we're able to identify a North Bayside winner and a South Bayside winner in each competition, then, then if it's safe to do so, even if you meet at a neutral site, you could host a Bayside Conference Championship and it gives the student athletes something to play for in the absence of a, a typical state championship. Okay. So it's kind of a win-win. Winner. <clears throat> the players and the parents going to say because the Big Ten is opening up the football season, I think October 24th. And they're traveling, I guess, and playing other teams from out of, out of town and so forth. Why can they do it when they travel longer distances? Why can't we? I'm sure that there are some students that have the ability uh, to catch a scholarship somewhere and that might not happen. Uh, it seems to me that when one section opens up, and let's face it, uh, there's a lot of money in NFL uh, football and, my gosh, basketball. But even still, they're playing the same game outside. Uh, fans are not allowed in. We could, somebody's going to say, well, why can't we do that? Well, actually, I think the more pertinent question is that I'm hearing is if Parks and Rec can have leagues and travel teams, why can't my kid play in school too? I think that locally, I get why colleges because they're testing. Right. Locally, these teams are not testing and they're playing. Yeah. 
So what we know is that we have to follow the Maryland Public Secondary Schools Athletic Association <laughs> rules. Mm -hmm. And so we are. <laughs> and anybody who doesn't have to follow those rules can do what they do, yeah. what we do, and, uh, and we follow these rules. Yeah. Those are the rules in effect today. But we have to stand by for what will happen next week. Well, and, I, and I can tell you that it is likely that changes are imminent. Oh, yeah. Sooner than later. Well, not with this schedule, though. They're, they're, they're committed to this schedule, do you think? It, it does appear that the competition schedule, so the second semester schedule, is, is pretty set. Okay. So this is, can be sent out to parents, and this is what they know? Yes. This so is this is available on the NPSSA website, um, and it's... As much as anything can be written in stone right now, it, this would be their competition season. Okay. Uh, and it does allow for all three seasons. It, does, it has a lot of positives. It has you know, a few drawbacks, but um, we were excited as, as athletic administrators to see something coming together that is in the near future. So do, I, just, I have just two words, cheerleading. Yes. Difficult. So I believe, though, though I, I have to double check, I believe the competition season has already been canceled due to the nature of the sport uh, though that is always something to change too I mean I would imagine if MPSSA gets up and running the Maryland State Cheerleading Association may decide to put together something as far as sideline cheer I would say Ken Allen High School and Queen Anne's County High School have a lot of smart individuals in there if we can figure out how to socially distance and support our athletes and give up more students a chance to engage absolutely uh, it will come down to budget because we typically, for a football game, would, would take one to two buses um, for our team. Well, two to three buses for our team and one to two buses for our cheerleaders. So That may not happen. Hopefully. We'll see. Yeah. And maybe staying closely geographic, you know, in travel, it's a little bit easier and expense to, to handle. But What about wrestling? I mean, that's, that's more contact than any other sport. Yes. So right now, the MPSSA has said that their hope is to have all sports available. Um, wow. But that's a great question. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Nope. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. All right. So Any next? other questions in general? In general. All right. It looks like good. we'll get a, 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 an update in October, and that's when our next... October 7th. And you'll know a lot more in two weeks what's going on, too. Like you said, the 7 to 14 day testing. And I, yep. I so. actually had a question about the PPE. Uh -huh. Only certain folks are, like, donning the gowns. And Correct. The whole uh, uh, Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. absolutely. Yeah, teachers so, are just generally a mask. Right. But, okay. it, you know, we, we do have some teachers and um, nurses have access to them. We have some um, special educators that have, you know. Diapers. And exactly. Okay. So next on the agenda, um, 2.04, update on anticipated budget shortfall for January 2021. Absolutely. And so there is no presentation there, but I did just want to share some information. So um, as, as it appears that um, in, this is based on some enrollment projections and what we believe, and there's nothing written in stone at this point. Um, there has been a conversation. Mr. Fister did attend um, a meeting in which this issue did come up again, so it's still sort of out on the table that there may be some loss in revenue. Um, and we do expect that there will be some loss in revenue. We have um, about 200 students that have withdrawn from our school system and started home schooling, home instruction. And so, as you know, the it lags a year, right? So the September 30th enrollment is going to have an impact on the amount of funding we get when it comes to MOE. And so the projection is that we will lose some funding. And if they were looking at the MOE per pupil allocation, which is about $8,100, that projection of $800 will be a whole lot more, right? But that won't happen in January 2021. So we still, nothing has been written, nothing in stone, but that is the conversation that it's, you know, and, and of course some legislation or some folks will be talking with the legislators, whether it is definitely some folks from Pazam. Our executive director is always a part of those conversations. Some school districts that do have um, folks that work with legislators will definitely be representing all school districts to try to mitigate any of those, um, you know, 
losses in revenue, but right now it is a conversation and it is based on MOE per pupil allocations and the losses in revenue that we'll have based Just on that. The, <coughs> now we did, oh, I'm sorry, we did petition um, a request from Dr. Salmon back, you know, earlier in the spring when it was evident that, you know, we may lose students to see if we can get that September 30th enrollment date pushed back. Um, but since it is in Comar, it's in legislation, they were not able to do that. Um, I don't know, perhaps they will, you know, try to get some legislation enacted to make that change. Um, but right now it's going to be on September 30th. By the loss of 200 students, the amount of money being spent here per student increases by the math. In other words, before it was a lower per student. Now it will be an increased number per student. And so that has some, what kind of effect with per student money spent higher. What, how does and, what, that and what you also have to consider, Mr. Anderson, is that that $8,100 is just the average. And when we look at the students that are leaving the district, which generally are not students that receive special services, right? And it costs more to educate a student that receives special services. So if the students that are staying are the students that require more services and therefore more funding, we will find ourselves at a pretty significant loss there. But the MOE should go up. But it will also decrease because we'll have less students next year, so we'll have less funding because per student. Because of the date that's picked. That's true. So <clears throat> I would begin tailoring a presentation to certain people in control of the money flow so that that can be very clearly explained oh. and that we need some extra funding. That's the only place we can go. Uh, it has to be very crisply and clearly explained. And if they say no, then... I know. Dr. Kane, I, I, all I, want to just, I was just at a MABE um, board of directors meeting this morning and they are, MABE is also in conjunction with PAZAM, you know, talking about how to come up with some legislation to make the change to Comar to protect us for next year at this particular September 30th count. I want to, I don't understand how this, how how the 800,000 comes in. I mean, what, so, um, that and, state, and, that, that and that could be a figure, an estimate from Mr. Fister, mm -hmm. um, but now I'm, I'm not, I'm not confident even in the $800,000 figure because nothing has been given to us in writing and it is still, as you probably learned this morning in your mate, a conversation. Right, Kent County has a big problem too, and they're the ones that were asked. That, that was a January number you mentioned to us. That it could was, be, be mm -hmm. less funding in January. Mm -hmm. I mean, and those state money we potentially would be losing. That's what January. I'm talking about as well. So the state money, remember, I mentioned that last time. This eight hundred thousand dollars is a reduction in state funding right. because the state is going to experience a reduction in funding, um, and so it's going to trickle down to schools. But I am not one hundred percent confident that the number is going to be eight hundred thousand it could be more perhaps less but that's the that's the estimate that we were given but nothing has come to me in writing right so that isn't associated that. with MOE that's MOE you're talking is for next year correct okay I think all schools have noticed declining enrollment hurts a school system that is correct. If we don't, I mean, and, and people in Queen Anne's County over the last 20 years were very concerned about growth and rapid growth in Queen Anne's County, which I understand. But if we don't grow two or 300 or 500 students a year, it puts a big burden on our budget each year because there's certain things you just increase generally, but you know, you get a, you know, a bigger increase when you have student population. And it's, it's tough. And I think Kent County is a perfect example. Well, they have 2,200 students maybe. Right around that, and it's tough to run a and, we, and we don't grow. No, what I'm saying, we have it over the last few years. Kids, right. But when we were growing, there was always, you know, just a maintenance effort gave you a bump. And and even our projections for the next ten years never get us ever to a hundred student increase, even in a year. It's and not that's what, and you 10, know. You, twenty. Yeah. You know. And that's not. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. And our last budget. In all fairness, we use some money that's, you know, for money for reincurring costs that are one time money. So I think, you know, we've got a hole to start with already. So we're looking at possibly good. a reduction in state funding 
And then following that, we're going to be looking at a reduction in um, local funding. And a budget that wasn't as balanced on one-time money. There's the confluence of good and evil. We have 55 and older housing being built. And the reason it's being built is uh, the persons that are building it and eventually selling it don't have to pay an education fee. Impact fee. Yeah, it's called an impact fee. They're not done dealing uh, with the budget. There's 7,000 houses going in uh, someplace and they're all 55 and older. The only good news is they pay real property tax. So the county is getting money and there should be an argument that some of that money has to be shared for the school system. But gradually, the number of children is going to level out and it's not going to grow because there's no room for single family development. The only good news is that the housing here, single family housing is cheaper than it is right across the bay. So maybe we'll get you know, young couples with children and it'll, somewhere it's gonna level out. But the county is getting extra money. Uh, Four Seasons is projected to add $8 million a year in property tax. Previously, that did not exist. So it isn't like there's major impoverishment, impoverishment as far as revenues. So, you know, we frankly just got to make a case and be insistent. I would add to that, and I would say um, there is impoverishment, and it's called the Board of Ed. <laughs> because we're not going to get it. Okay, so well, that's, um, I mean, I, we're, we're all aware, we, we, should we know, for Thanks for the update. we see it coming. That. It's too important. We, it is too important, and we're all on, to, on board with that and have co multiple conversations with our county commissioners between now and then so that we're all on the same page. Any other questions? I have a question. Mm -hmm. So the big question I'm hearing is, aren't we... When they announced that they wanted some kids back in school and the governor said there's this pot of money schools can apply for to help get kids, are we applying for any of that money? Uh, well, as soon as we get any application that there is, I've not gotten anything about it at okay. this point. Because that's the big thing. Oh, we can get money. We can, well, it's not yeah. going to happen. It's called the overnight. carrot. Nope. It's, <laughs> it's called it's, a it's, carrot hanging As soon as that head. comes out, as soon as that application comes out, yep, we'll be applying. We'll be going for it. Mm -hmm. okay. Ten million dollars, yeah. That's yeah. his pot it, for it's ten out million. There. <laughs> Everybody else. I wonder where that's coming from, it. too. I know. <laughs> it's all good. It sounded I'm good. Out after Ju July fifteenth, two thousand twenty-one. Yeah, we'll see. Just one last comment doesn't sure. pertain necessarily to this uh, shortfall, but there was a question with regard to the number of retirees. Um, that was a question that was asked and that can't be talked about in closed session, so I'll just go ahead and talk about it. We have 436 retirees on our health plan. 392 of them are uh, retired employees. 27 of them are spouses. You don't have to write it down. I have a paper for you. you. Um, 17 of them are former executive team members. Um, and we had 20 retirements for the 1920-20 school year. And then for um, so far this year, we have had two retirements, one certificated and one support. Thank you. Thank you for that update. Uh, no other questions? Nothing else? Go to the order. We do have a meeting October 7th, which Dr. Kane alluded to, uh, with another update on the reopening plan. October 21st is our next board work session. Um, with nothing else, do I have a motion to go into closed session? Yes, I pursued a general provisions of Article 3-305 and 3-104. I move to Board of Education, Queen Anne's County, meet in closed session to discuss, appoint, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluations of, of appointees, employees, or officials whom this public body has jurisdiction to consider matters that relate to negotiations and to perform administrative function to consult with counsel and obtain legal advice. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Questions or comments on the motion? Hearing none, I call for the vote on the motion to go into closed session. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. We will close out in closed session. Mr. Strait, thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you for being with us. Closed.